the pool boy. I was possessed and controlled. I always hated the house on Pond Street. Ever since the first moment I saw it from the outside, it gave off a creepy energy that left a knot in my heart. Inside, it was full of six-foot mirrors. Every single room had something off about that I couldn't really pinpoint accurately. The only room that gave me a relief from this feeling was the bathroom in the downstairs efficiency apartment. I'd use it often. Every time I walked into the house through the back middle door, I'd feel like someone was watching me through the wall hanging quilt. There was also a sense of annoyance and frustration emanating from the covered mirror, as if the lurker's view was blocked. A few times at night in my bedroom, I saw figures in the mirrors on the closet. There was a man wearing a top hat, standing in the middle of the room. A tall guy rocked in a glider in the corner of the room, next to the closet mirrors. I didn't have a gliding rocker in my bedroom. The highlight of living in this house was having the pool, at least in the summer. Something lurked in and by the pool that wasn't happy. The pool was dreadful during the winter months. We moved to this house in the fall and couldn't play in the pool immediately. Since the first moment I noticed the pool, I could tell there was a strange, eerie energy hanging around it. The pool and the surrounding pool deck looked strange and eerie. It was inviting and comfortable more than anything, though, but never exactly comfortable. From the very beginning, I felt there was a little boy with weird, evil intentions. He didn't want to hurt anyone, but at the same time, he wanted to hurt someone. Whenever he pleased, it seemed. I dismissed the energy as electrical impulses, maybe from the pump and filter. I later realized I was wrong, very wrong. During the first summer, while I was only in the pool once, I swam to the bottom of the deep end. About 12 feet. I was on the other side of the pool where the floor filter was. I felt a slight tug on my leg. It felt like somebody skimmed against it. Freaked me out, but I thought nothing of it. Thought it must have just been some sort of debris. But my opinion changed during the winter. When the pool was closed up and covered with snow, I was drawn to it. There were several instances where I'd go outside to make a snowman or a fort, maybe sled down the hill on the side yard, but... I did these things, yeah, but... I'd also have to frequently check the pool. I would have to stand on the pool deck at the edge, overlooking where the deep end drops off. Just look. Sometimes I'd see the top of a little boy's head up and down beneath the ice. Sometimes I'd be by the pool and I'd have no recollection of opening the gate. Or walking into the area. One time a cold day in January, I found myself by the pool. Just as I realized I didn't remember getting there, I had a sudden urge to check the strength of the ice by standing on it. The conflicting voice of logic told me not to, and I didn't. At least I thought I hadn't. Next thing I knew, seconds later in a trance, I found myself stepping down into the ice. All the while I'm thinking, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to be like 11 years old and I'm going to get trapped under ice in my pool. I tried to resist, but I couldn't. My heart's pounding. As I'm standing on the ice, I managed to turn around. I tried to step up on the back deck, but I'm paralyzed. I'm terrified. I don't want to die, I thought. I heard an extremely faint, almost inaudible crack beneath the snow-covered ice as I plummeted into the icy water below. Instantly, after that, the trance lifted and I pulled myself out. I plummeted waist-deep. I wasn't cold, but I felt shook. I actually questioned if I had actually fallen in. Wet ski pants were the validation. I couldn't get the boy out of my head. As I went about my evening, the boy was on my mind. It was confusing. A chilling thought popped into my head. Is Pond Street named after a long-gone pond? Did a boy drown in the pool? 
Is there a mirror world where a boy did drown in the pool? The boy in the mask, so vivid, was it more than just a dream? This was a dream that was very vivid and very real. A month later and it's still disturbing me. On an evening a few days before Thanksgiving in 2019, my wife and I went to bed fairly early in hopes to get some much needed sleep before our one month old son wakes up for a bottle. I fell asleep fairly quickly. I dreamt that I was in dark gray night scene. It was a landscape similar to downtown Bangor, Maine, against the waterfront and surrounding land. But there were no cars parked in the street. There might have been a few stray cars, but for the most part, none parked anywhere. I'm apparently walking home, although I don't know how I got downtown, and I was having difficulty finding out where the bridge to Brewer was. In the eerie gray, everything looked too much alike. I walked a bit and realized that it was, I was going the wrong way. So I circled around in place and chose another direction and walked a little then. Soon realizing that I still wasn't in the right direction, I circled again and chose a different one. And my scenery seemed to be making sense. I was relieved. It was a long walk home, but at least I was on my way. Just as quickly as I was relieved, I was nervous again. I was being followed. I looked around. I couldn't see anyone. And just as I began to relax, thinking it was nothing, a kid wearing black with a gray mask over his face and a hoodie with a hood over his head walked beside, then in front of me in a weird motion, like a curling walk. I stopped walking. He tilted his masked head one way than the other. He lifted his right fist up, the index finger, the only finger, not locked in a fist. He lifted his other hand in the same way and used an index finger to purposefully point the index finger of his right. He curled backwards a few steps, walked forwards, then disappeared somewhere behind me. Glad he was gone. I continued to try my find my way home. That's when I realized the bridge into Brewer didn't exist and that I was trapped in Bangor. I found myself disoriented in a parking lot and I couldn't figure out how or which one it was. I thought maybe the wing lot where I parked my car when I go to work. But I could see Hollywood slots, the casino in the close distance. So that didn't make sense. It was also weird. I noticed the parking lot that I was in had a road going through it then it occurred to me that I was not in a parking lot, but smack in the middle of the road. It was like I was in a video game where the rest of the map hadn't been unlocked yet. This location, inconsistency, helped me realize that it was a dream, and I was done with it. I told myself to wake up. It wasn't easy. As much as I tried to wake up, I couldn't. So, I figured since now that I knew it was a dream... I could gradually wake myself up. As I should be in a lucid dream state, I continued to walk around. The boy in the mask appears. Just appears. No warning right in front of me. He has a pocket knife in his right hand. The short blade is exposed to the air. He signals the number one with his left index and then brings his hand closer to his chest and cuts his index finger with the blade. Beads of blood ooze out and fall into his shirt sleeve. He puts his bleeding finger to his masked mouth. Shh! I can hear faintly. Fed up, I tried to wake myself up to no avail. Walk around again, saying to myself, This is a dream. I'm dreaming. Wake up. I'm dreaming. Wake up. It wasn't long before a masked kid appeared again. I attempted to walk away from him. He wouldn't let me pass. So I decided to run away. He remained in front of me, refusing to let me through. We ended up face to face, circling each other, all the while I'm trying to wake up and try to get away from this creepy kid. No matter what I do, I can't escape. As we circle each other, he cuts his index finger and then puts it into his mouth when I hear the faint shh. 
He does it all over again. I'm done. This is fucked. Wake up, Paul. I demand myself. No luck. The masked kid disappears again. Wake up, Paul. I demand myself again. No luck. Maybe if I avoid to acknowledge the presence of the masked kid when I see him again, I thought. I continue to walk around, hoping I just wake up. The masked kid appears again. I don't acknowledge I see him. I just keep walking. All the while, he remains directly in front of me. As much as I deny the fact that I don't see him in actuality, I do and I can't ignore him. He seems to thrive on the fact that I can't ignore him too. He proceeds to cut his index finger as the blood rolls down his finger and into his sleeve. He puts the bloody finger to his masked lips, shh, again faintly, and he mutters. I began to chant, I need to wake up, as we circle each other as before. He repeatedly cuts his finger and then puts it to his face, shh, he mutters quietly. We repeated this cycle several times. Suddenly in the background, I hear a baby's whimper. It sounded a lot like my son Matthew. I knew it was. I need to wake up, I yell. The masked kid puts his bloody finger to his mouth, shakes his head, no, and says, shh, in the same typical fashion. We continue to circle. I continually tell myself to wake up. Meanwhile, my baby whimpers are getting louder in the background and starting to sort of sound like he's beginning to cry. As we continue to circle, my wife Katie nudges me. Paul, can you feed Matthew? I finally woke up and I'm laying in bed. I can see my bedroom. Yep, I replied sleepily. Then I'm dragged back to the dream, circling again. Matt needs me, I said to the kid. He shakes his head, no. Katie nudges me. Can you feed Matthew? Yep, I reply. I can see my bedroom again. I'm in bed. As I try to get out of bed, I find myself being pulled back into the dream. I resist with all that I can. I shook my head to wake up and force myself out of bed. I'm on my feet in the bedroom. I touch the dresser next to me to make sure. I'm awake. I walk around our then queen bed to pick up Matthew, who's crying in his bassinet. I'm so relieved I'm awake. I take him to the kitchen to get a bottle, heat it up, and give it to him in the living room. This was the most vivid dream I've ever had. I haven't been able to get it out of my mind since. It was more like a nightmare. I could smell, I could touch. Walking in those circles was tiring. Was this nightmare more than just a nightmare? Mount Hope Cemetery, the very same one that Stephen King mentions in his books, and the one that he cameos on the Pet Cemetery. Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time, it's an easy feeling to brush off. But there are three instances where I've been shook to the core. The first... I was in fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm. So I knew then that it was going to happen, and I dreaded it, hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class, they were all having a wonderful time, and I was immersed in vibes that were making me kind of sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eyes. I didn't want to, but I did anyway, and while I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone, and that maybe I was even bothering someone. I managed to rub two, the third I picked... My crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me. When I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me, and I stopped dead. I, for a second, I couldn't move. This gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to talk reason to myself. 
it's a 117-year-old old rotted corpse. Can't possibly be anything. To no avail. I could have forced myself to rub this one, but I decided that wasn't the best. I didn't rub a third one. I couldn't get myself to do it. it freaked me out. I said it out loud to someone in particular. Well, I guess no one in particular. That there's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... And I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt and it wasn't peaceful. If I rubbed that grave, someone or something would have attached to me and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. The second. It was in the summer of 2012. I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's and lived in, well, this is spelled V-E-A-Z-E-I. Vizi? Vizi? Vizier? Not sure. Sorry. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw someone. I thought it was a dumb teenager doing something stupid. It wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed to be bent on anger and misery. It must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow standing right next to it. It was akimbo to the thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, even as close as he was to the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged towards me. Fuck, I yelled. Completely sure I was about to get possessed, the akimbo one flinched, then they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, hard pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again, through Mount Hope. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything. Then suddenly two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast. One was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me. The one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road on the other side. The moment they began getting smaller, they were gone. Conclusion Of course there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I have sensed other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them, though. There's definitely something sinister about that cemetery. Part of me feels like there might be something there that wants to latch on to me. Story number four. I do ghost tours. So I do ghost tours in Savannah, Georgia. A great start already. I love paranormal stuff, ghosts, demons, angels, etc., etc. And ever since I've started working here, I've yet to have a tour where something weird hasn't happened. So I have a lot of experiences around this. This one, though, was my very first. So a few months back in August, when I first started working there, we give tours through some homes. And I'm contractually bound to not say where, sorry. But basically super famous homes, and on the second floor of this house there's a nursery. Now a nursery is already super creepy with period dolls and furniture, and scares most people, including myself. I'm not scared of the dolls yet, but I'm kind of scared of the kid that lives in there. Oddly enough, there's no evidence or news that a child ever died in this home, but I was told about him by my former co-workers. Three people have told me that they've caught him on camera on my tour, and one person last week put a name to him. He's a young lad about eight years old, in a late 1800s nightgown, and with a bowl cut. He's a devious bugger and has been known to turn on people's phone flashes and ringers as well as scare many young kids whose parents don't believe their kid when they say stuff like, Mommy, can you tell him I don't want to play with him? Stuff like that. So in August, there was a three-day stent where he would be caught in a room in different spots. 
the second night, my friend was on the tour and sent a picture, and he just caught this kid standing in the back peeking over a crib. That isn't what bothered me. What really messed with my head is what happened the following week. The house got a different feel to it. No one liked to be there for too long, and everybody, including myself and my co-workers, noticed it seemed much colder than normal. Note. We contractually cannot touch or alter anything in the house without receiving a massive penalty of fine and being fired, which includes the thermostat, obviously. Well, as we all braced ourselves through that week, I got caught up in something I really wish I didn't. As we were moving people to a different room and I was waiting to get the next group into the house, I remembered that my manager had gone to the basement to use the private restroom, and I wanted to make sure that they turned off the downstairs light. So I make my way over to the nook and open the door. There's a woman standing at the bottom of the steps. In the quickest instant, I noticed that she had flowing brown hair and was dressed in a very formal, very 1800s hoop skirt and dress. That was just in a split second because before my brain could process a response or a greeting, she looked up the stairs at me and her eyes were glowing green, like flashlights through the dark downstairs area. She glared right through me and started running up the stairs. I say running, but more so like flying, charging right up the stairs. So I slam the door and book it out of the house, call my manager to notify him that I needed to just take a break. One shift was over without another hitch. I got to asking around, and four separate people told me that I had seen Mary. Again, can't give the full name, sorry. As fate would have it, Mary died in that home and had quite a few children, not all of whom were fully documented for. They proceed to explain that since infant mortalities were so high, it was very possible many kids were unaccounted for thus leading to a possible explanation for the kid upstairs. My major issue then is, why did she come after me? Story number five. I do ghost tours, part two. So someone talked about the Telfair mansion. I'll call it a mansion, a museum, and a house. And Mary Telfair herself. And as I've come to find out, she might hate me. I've tried to go in there and look around, you know, at the top museum collection a few times. And I step in, and I immediately feel like either A, someone is screaming into both of my ears, or B, someone is pounding a brick against my skull. So I just... Don't go near there too often if I can help it, especially not at night. On the same token, the building is beautiful, absolutely amazing. Unconfirmed, but I'm pretty sure that when she was basically, I guess she was considered basically the last of her family line, her wealth rivaled that of the Rockefeller and Vanderbilt, like filthy rich, you know? And there's a lot of superstition surrounding her will. Allegedly, in her will, she demanded that female actors never be allowed near the home and some other things I don't need to get into. You can read her will on their website. The website, you can type in the Telfair's will. Anyway, on to my experience. So back in early September, I was about to leave Savannah for a bit and I decided to drive the tour one more time late at night with my then-girlfriend. So we're driving around and get to the Telfair Square, where we both get really quiet. We both feel like something's up, but neither of us says anything. So I pull over in the square adjacent to the mansion, and start just looking around, trying to get the jovial mood back. She's on her phone when I look over to the museum. That's when I see it. A woman is standing next to the building, arms crossed, glaring at me. I'm used to getting odd glances, but she was shooting daggers through my skull, metaphorically, thankfully. And I, looking back, was staring right through her, literally. She was opaque, and standing behind her is a shadow. 
tall and only identifiable between the literal darkness, and it's kind of like a purple-like outline that kept flowing around it. Like liquid darkness. Red eyes slanted and like some demonic entity pulled out of a movie. In the moment this happens, my girlfriend looking up from her phone just says, Drive! in this super concerned voice. So I do, because I don't want to stick around. I peel out of the square and it feels like we're being chased. She couldn't see anything, but it felt like we were surrounded by an sort of just a darkness trying to close in on all sides. And the red eyes blinked in and out of my rear view. Best idea was to not stop. That's when she starts spilling out directions. Simple. Turn here. Next right. Go. Simple stuff. But all the super concerned and rhythmic like a GPS without a destination. Just an escape route. We travel halfway across the city before the feeling begins to fade, and we both start panting as if we've been running for our lives. There is no safe feeling between us. We're scared. We find a safe, well-lit spot, and we sort of debrief. So I say what I saw, and she said that she suddenly did not feel safe. So, somewhat on the same page. Neither of us knows what happened, and this wasn't the first time that she's felt that way and told me to drive. This was the first time, however, where I saw something. I don't know what happened or what I did to upset anyone near that house, but I still make a point to never travel around the city, especially near Telfair Square alone. The Lady in Pink Many years ago I was in college. I lived with my brother off and on. The house had a downstairs with a living room, dining room, kitchen, and a master bedroom, and an upstairs with the kids' rooms on one side. A bathroom on the other and a bit of space in between the front of the stairs. It really wasn't big enough to be called a room, but it wasn't exactly a hallway. They set up a futon for me and that became my area. I remember thinking that the upstairs felt a little off, especially my niece's room. After a few months, I started sleeping on the couch downstairs. Partly because the kids would disturb me in the morning, but also because I never felt right up there. There were several strange things that happened while I lived there. One night, my brother, sister-in-law, niece, nephew, and I were at the table eating dinner. From upstairs, we heard one of my niece's talking dolls say something like, I want to play with you. Excuse my attempt. It sounded like a horror movie cliche bullshit, I know, but it was extremely unsettling when it happened in real life. No one else was in the house, and they didn't have any pets. Another time, my niece was coming down the stairs when she fell suddenly. I remember thinking it was really strange because it didn't look like she tripped. It was more like she'd been pushed. Her necklace had broken during her fall, but not at the clasp. The string had just broken like someone yanked it off. Then one night while I was sleeping upstairs, I woke up and felt really uneasy. I think it was around two or three in the morning. Since the kids' rooms were across from the bathroom, they had to walk through my area to get to one another. I opened my eyes and saw what looked like somebody in a pink bathrobe go into the bathroom. I didn't recall my niece having a pink bathrobe, so I thought it was, you know, just kind of strange. After a while, when no lights had switched on and I didn't hear the sink or the toilet flushing, I started to get up to see if anybody was in there, but I got this really bad feeling that I should just leave it alone. In the morning, I asked my niece if she had a pink bathrobe, and I asked both my niece and nephew if either of them had gone to the bathroom in the middle of the night. They all said no. Some time later, I mentioned the whole thing to my sister-in-law. She asked me if my brother had told me to say that. I was confused and said, no, why? She told me that when they had first moved in, she kept having this dream that there was a lady in a pink bathrobe sitting in the living room. They kept telling her to leave, but she wouldn't. Then one night, she dreamed that the lady was in the doorway of her room, screaming, and then flew at her and started choking her. Ah, thank you, Bug. Excuse me. 
A while after all this had happened, my sister-in-law went around the house saying, Okay, lady, I know you're here. Then she had the dream of moving again, and this time they put the boxes all around her instead of telling her to leave. I moved out shortly after, but the incidents mostly stopped after that as far as I know. My sister-in-law said that they just had to learn to live with her. Someone came to say Merry Christmas from the other side. My brother and I have different dads. Unfortunately, his dad passed away a year prior to when this story is set. My mom and his dad didn't do well together. He wasn't a bad guy, just troubled and really didn't know how to be a good partner. My mom said that after they separated and she met my dad and got pregnant with me, my brother's dad said, You finally got the girl you always wanted. This was something that she had told him when they were together. That she always wanted a daughter, but obviously they didn't stay together to have another kid. When I was little, he was always really sweet to me. Not in a creepy way, just always interested in asking how I am. My mom said that she felt like he always felt drawn to me. Maybe because he regretted the end of the relationship with her. and I, in some way, made him think that he could, you know, who knows. Okay, so moving on to the story. A few weeks after my brother's dad died, I had a dream that I was in the hallway with him. He told me that he was okay and that he wanted to show me something. He grabbed a door handle, opened the door, and the brightest light came through, but then I woke up. I so wish I could remember what he showed me or if he did show me anything at all. So now fast forward in time. It was Christmas Eve of 2009, a year later. I was upstairs in my bedroom and I heard music playing. We had a room next to mine with all kinds of toys because I had a lot of nieces and nephews that came over. I assumed the music was coming from there, so I walked into the room to check. It was not coming from that room and I realized it was coming from the bathroom. Mm, the bathroom? Odd, I thought. I went in there and realized the music was coming from a three-tier box each tier with a drawer where my mom kept jewelry and other keepsakes. As soon as I touched the box, the music abruptly stopped. I was 21 at this time, and in all the years of living with my parents, I've never heard music come from this box. And she had it my entire life. I go downstairs and tell the weirdest thing that just happened to my mom, and I tell her this whole story. Her face goes completely white. She looks totally freaked out and her eyes well up with tears. She then tells me that this is a jewelry box that her ex-husband, my brother's dad who died, gave her on their wedding day. She said it hasn't played music in 35 years because it broke. We even went upstairs to try to recreate the music and get it to work, but no luck. I just smiled and shrugged and said, Well, I guess he's saying Merry Christmas. I don't know why he chooses me to go through for all this, for all these messages. We weren't close, but I do think part of it is that he just knows I won't brush things off as my brain is kind of weird. I feel that they're from him and he knows I'll share the message. My brother pretty much hasn't been very receptive to the messages and I don't want to make him uncomfortable or upset him. The Casual Haunting That friend of mine has a fellow student who comes from an old and noble family in the North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. And they own a rather large and old estate, built a few generations ago where the family lived ever since. He moved to his university city a few hundred kilometers away and only stays at the family house over the holidays and a couple of nights a year. One of those times, his parents left for a weekend and he was the only one home, spent the evenings in the living room watching TV. The living room was the heart of the estate with an open fireplace and posh furniture. He was sitting in an old armchair that he knew was older than himself and maybe even his parents. The armchair stood freely in the room facing the TV so that the closed living room's doors were in his back. 
Oops. As you might have imagined, we now come to the ghost part of the story, as he heard clearly audible footsteps coming from the parquet floors in the lobby downstairs. He turned the TV off and tried listening closely when he heard them again. He knew he was the only one home and thought of intruders. Maybe somebody saw his parents leave and wasn't assuming anybody would be home since he had moved out a couple of years prior. He got up, went downstairs, turned on all the lights, checked the locked front door, searched the kitchen and the downstairs bathroom. No sign of intrusion nor any more steps. Relieved, he made his way back to the living room and continued watching TV. After some time, the footsteps left his mind. After all, it was an old house, and he wasn't used to the noises anymore. Then after some time, he felt what he described as a chilliness suddenly filling the room as if brought in by a light breeze. Once he noticed it, that he was for sure it hadn't been there and before, then the footsteps reappeared, but this time right behind him, between the door and the back of the armchair, sounding as if it was approaching him. He turned around hastily, only to find an empty room. The footsteps had disappeared and took the chilliness with them. Nothing more happened that night, but the eerie feeling remained. It wasn't ghosts per se that he was afraid of, but he couldn't explain what he had experienced. The next morning he tried to casually mention the weird experiences to his father on the phone. His father wasn't surprised or incredulous, quite the contrary. He told him to call the priest, as it was probably quote-unquote just his grandfather wanting to sit in his armchair and wasn't able to because it was occupied. Apparently his father used to be, or I guess apparently his father used to be calling the priest every now and then just to speak a blessing and put the souls to rest. And they experience steps, noises, or chilliness a couple of times a year that stop after the priest is visited. They had been doing this even while he was still living at the home and never told him, never really scared him either. His father apologized for not thinking about that before leaving for the weekend, but nothing had happened over the ten or so months that he simply kind of forgot, as he was so used to that casual haunting. The Light on the Lake My dad's bought an old house. It's a homestead from the 1840s in rural Nova Scotia. It has been a ski resort, a bed breakfast, a farm, an artist retreat, and a wood mill on the property until the 1960s. It has a very long history. Many people in the community are familiar with the house and the lakefront property that it sits on. Locals have told us how much the place meant for them, and told us stories about the owner of the house between 1971 and 2004. This guy was proper loved in the community and used to let the community children swim the lake. The house isn't on the lake. The house sits on a steep hill over the lake. It's about 200 feet in elevation change, 300 feet between the lake and the house. One winter, brother and sister wanted to play on the ice, so they asked the owner of the property if they could. The owner said no, but they were welcome to walk down to the shore of the lake. The sister was fine enough with this answer, but the brother decided that he wanted to do what he had done a month ago when the ice was thicker. He decided he would toboggan down the entire hill, onto the gravel, and then onto the ice. A popular stunt many kids have done before, but never in late February or March. With the sister begging him not to, he slid down the hill, across the gravel, and onto the ice. The ice along the shore was strong enough to hold his weight, but he slid further and further until he slowed over the thin enough ice to break from underneath him. Firefighters failed to find him for hours until he was found by the shore underneath the ice. It's unknown if he was trying to swim to shore while trapped underneath, or floated that way. Shortly after my dad moved, I was in one of the guest rooms that looked over the lake. It was a June evening, and the world was filled with the sounds of small frogs trying to fuck. <laughs> I was admiring the view from the window when I saw light over the lake. 
The sun had been down for maybe five or ten minutes. Only orange and blue haze was left around the horizon. As I looked over the lake, I saw a small light moving quickly around it. I assumed it was a reflection of some sort, but it caught my eye enough to watch. It was darting, and it was darting seemingly at random points, quickly stopping and continuing again in a new direction. I thought it may have been a bird or a group of moths. It was dark. All I knew is that I saw this thing and it was strange, and I remembered it. This was long before I knew what had happened on the lake. A couple of months later and I'm back at my dad's house with some family, and over drinks the topic of witnessing paranormal activity came up. People shared stories and eventually I talked about the light on the lake. My dad's significant other begins grilling me with questions about how the light moved and so on, and she claims to have seen these lights as well. My dad would see the light on the lake a few weeks after. A close cousin sees it a few weeks after that. We would go on to share theories about the light that darts across the ice for a while. A couple of months go by and my dad's at a neighbor's house. The neighbor also lives on the lake. They were telling my dad about all the stories about the lake, pretty much a detailed account of everything that took place at that lake in the past 40 years. And eventually the story about the kid who drowned came up. As the husband finished telling my dad about the story, the wife said something to the effect of, Me and my mom have been seeing a light over the lake occasionally since that day. They then had a long conversation about witnessing paranormal activity. The Two Experiences in the Same House both of these stories took place seven to eight years ago, but I still remember them vividly. They both took place at my grandma's house, which always creeped me, my siblings, and cousins out when we were younger. My parents have told me that they even found the house creepy like someone was watching them, but didn't want to scare us kids. Both events aren't that big, but I figured I'd share them anyway. One night, me and my cousins were up late at night playing video games probably 2 or 3 a.m. Of course, we got hungry and wanted to make some pizza rolls, so we sneaked by our grandmother's room. She didn't like us being up late. And now we decide who's going to go downstairs first. To paint the scene, it's pitch black, like can't see your hand two inches from your face black. And we were a little scared, so my cousins forced me to go down the stairs first. Since it's so dark, I'm slowly going down as I don't want to fall down. I also couldn't tell when I reached the bottom because the stairs and the floor were both made out of the same wood. So when I reached the bottom, I took a few more cautious steps forward just to make sure. That's when I bumped into something taller than me that felt like when you run into a person taller than you. It completely stopped me in my tracks. I looked up and I see this figure right in front of me move to the left. And remember, it's pitch black. And at the same time, one of my cousins turns on the light. And there I am, standing in the middle of the living room with nothing around me. They, of course, saw nothing, and I found it more creepy that something was probably just watching us walk down the stairs. The second story takes place in a very similar scenario, except I'm the only one with one of my cousins this time. We sneak downstairs to grab a bite to eat around 2 or 3 a.m. He's eating some cereal and we're chilling at the dining room table sitting across from each other. I'm talking while he's mainly focused on eating. Then there's this loud growl next to my left ear which freezes both of us. I look at him and slowly say, Dude, did you hear that shit? He nods. Then we both start laughing, probably because we didn't know what else to do. The race to get upstairs once the lights were out was full of panic. I occasionally bring up the second story with the cousin who was there, and he still remembers exactly like I do, so I know I'm not imagining it. The Poker Set Four years ago, my uncle passed away. He was only 60, had the kindest soul. 
He would call me all the time and tell me that he wanted to take me to the casino when I got old enough. Unfortunately, he never got the chance to, as at the time of passing I was 20, the beginning of January is my birthday. On the 10th of December of 2016, my family and myself laid him to rest. We were all pretty sad about it, but in good spirits, we laid him to rest with all of his favorites. Whiskey, some sweets, an entire pack of cards. We placed them in his hands, a full ace, and said our final goodbyes. At the time, I lived in South Philadelphia for school. The morning after, I was expecting an Amazon delivery of Christmas presents for my girlfriend at the time. So I went into the kitchen to wait for the package that was supposed to be delivered soon. Taking a look out the window, I noticed the weather. I remember it vividly being a wet, rainy morning. Fog was in the air, and you could see maybe 20 feet in front of you. Definitely an odd vibe, given the time of the year. Decided to take a quick look on my step. The package wasn't delivered yet. But I looked down and saw this small wooden box sitting on my doorstep. I had no idea what it was, so I took it inside to sit on my kitchen table to get a look. I open it up and I see this... the box. I was absolutely speechless. I looked it over around the house to make sure nobody was playing a weird joke on me. I then noticed that both sets of cards were gone. This could either be an odd coincidence or something else at play. The reason why it's so odd is because I've absolutely no idea why somebody would be walking around with this in South Philly and out of all people leave it on my step. All of my roommates were gone for the day, so it had to have happened after they left. Also in South Philly you can't really leave stuff on your step or porch unless you want to get rid of it. I told all my family about it, and they were all just as weird as out as I was. I took the set back to my grandparents' house, where he lived at the time that he died. As soon as I set it down on the table, it all of a sudden looked not as pristine. It could have been the light, but as soon as I went to go move it for dinner, it fell apart in my hands, like the glue from the box all of a sudden dried up in my hands and no longer became of use. I don't know whether or not this counts as a ghost story, or if this even counts as an encounter, but it definitely was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever encountered. Nothing like that's ever coincidentally lined up in my life like that. My first supernatural experience. When I was in high school, I worked at the Boy Scout camp in the Buffalo National River. It was a summer camp and high school adventure outpost, and I spent two summers working there. The summers of 14 and a month in the summer of 15. When I started working there, older staff members started telling me stories of how haunted the camp and the trails that gave access to across the Buffalo River were. Things like children laughing in the distance, blood-curdling screams coming from deep in the woods, a haunted cabin across the river, and a slew of others. For lack of a better term, we could call them campfire stories. Me being a total skeptical of all this brushed it off and nearly the entirety of the first summer saw or heard nothing out of the ordinary. The only odd thing I saw the whole summer was lightning bugs. One by one turning red near the mouth of a trail leading to the river, until all the lightning bugs you could see in that direction were flashing a sort of sickly, sickly red color. This is something that multiple people I worked with had told me happened, and it didn't really scare me. It was more of a feeling of bewilderment and curiosity, but once again, I thought little of it. Before I get into the experiences I had the next summer, I think giving a brief overview of how the camp was laid out would be helpful. As I said before, camp sat on one side of the river with a large empty field running along the camp side of the river used for various activities beyond this field. The land rose up in the hills and the bluffs and trails led up the hill to the center of the camp where the mess hall and trading post were located as well as the camp offices and trails led up and down from the centralized location to the campsites and they spread in every direction from the mess hall. 
across the river from the trail leading down from the field. You could see the ford of the river and cross multiple hiking trails and led up to the camp's excuse me, penultimate hike, antenna pine. Never heard that term, penultimate. Hmm. Which three and a half miles up rested atop a ridge and the namesake pine could be seen from the camp itself. The first experience that was truly strange at the camp was the second weekend that I'd been there in the summer of 15. A friend of mine that I worked with there, we're going to call M, ha, had told me stories of a moonshiner who used to work near the camp. He told me that a still was out there and he wanted to go find it. Given it was our day off and a beautiful summer day, I jumped on the opportunity to hike. We head out of the camp, across the river, and carried on up the trail. We ran across a group of high, of high adventure staff hmm, and asked them, I don't know if they were high or if that's a thing, but moving on. We asked one of them that we knew fairly well if we had, if they possibly had, shit. <laughs> this is written crazily. We ran across a group of high adventure staff and asked one of them we knew fairly well if he had heard of a still in the surrounding area. He immediately answered yes and pointed directly off the trail to our right, telling us that we would run into a creek in the woods out that way and to follow it away from the camp until we came onto a rock outcropping in a creek. Having the directions we needed, we stepped off the trail about half a mile from the river and within about a minute we found the aforementioned creek. We turned up the creek and followed it away from the river for about 20 minutes until we saw it. A rock bluff no more than five feet high and about a 20 foot opening. However, the entirety of the mouth of this bluff had a handmade rock wall built into it with a small door about four feet in height and a small window and vent for the still about eight inches by eight inches. We were blown away. I can remember it being one of the coolest things I've ever found in the woods, and after we both crawled inside, we found it empty, with the exception of some thin copper tubing and a couple of mash pans that were deteriorated greatly. We hung around for another five minutes or so investigating the place and noticed trails leading off in opposite directions that we'd come in. Not well-made trails, but more like the type created by deer. I noticed this, and then my friend seemed convinced that they were moonshiner trails. We wanted to follow them and see where they led. Rolling my eyes again to his suggestion of them being hooch runner trails, I followed him. Not having an issue with getting more chance to see nature and enjoy the day, I followed along. Looking to the left and right of me as I walked and taken in the view. We followed these trails uphill that ran alongside the creek for probably about a quarter mile before M turned to me and said, Hey, let's go back to the camp. I don't feel so good thought nothing of this and I turned around. We walked back the way that we had come for probably ten minutes and I noticed M, not me, was sweating more than he had been before. He just told me that the sun must be getting to him and kept walking. I had him drink some water and he seemed normal, albeit quieter than usual. We carried on and my worry faded as he was walking and breathing normally. As we walked I continued to look around and at some point zoned out staring at M's backpack. I eventually ran into the back of M's backpack and was snapped out of my thoughts. I pushed his backpack forward and told him to get moving. No response. I shook his shoulders and asked him if he was okay. All he replied was, look. He raised his finger pointing directly ahead of us. Ahead was the still that we had been at not only half an hour before and immediately to the right of the door was without a doubt the most blood-chilling thing I'd ever seen. As soon as I'd laid eyes on it, I was hit with the most real sense of dread and fear I've had in my whole life. It was as if I knew I wasn't supposed to be seeing it, and I was paralyzed, frozen still. A black shape stood about seven inches tall, motionless. Albeit its composition appeared to have some sort of movement within it, it struck me as a shadow at first, and I immediately looked up to see if there was anything that could be casting it. Nothing, just the forest. 
I looked back quickly and looked at the object for another five seconds or so before it started moving. It moved itself directly center of the doorway. It compressed down to the height of the doorway, then rushed in. I think he meant feet. I had thought that this was just a shadow, but when it moved, I could see there was dimensionality to it. And after looking at it for a few seconds, I could make out what seemed to be a thick black smoke within the shape and filling it. It seemingly disappeared as soon as it entered the still, and before I could say a word, M was sprinting back towards the main trail and camp. I rapidly followed him, and neither of us stopped until we reached the river crossing, and we could see other staff across the river. As we sat there catching our breaths, neither said a word. I sat listening and turned towards the woods that we had just come out of, half expecting to hear or see something crashing through the woods behind. It was silent. All I could hear was my own breathing and the sound of the river feet behind me. No birds, no squirrels, no human voices despite staff, and even outsiders using the trails frequently on the weekends. As I was taking my shoes off, to go through the river again, M asked me, What in the fuck was that thing? I simply responded with a shrug, not having the nerve to break the silence all around me. I was still hyper aware of how quiet it was while we were crossing and was almost slammed by the noise I experienced when we finally hit the other side. Birds were chirping all over, the wind was making the leaves on the trees rustle, and the voices of fellow staff members carried through the field normally. M never said anything about the sound but I honestly think that he was so shaken that he hadn't noticed. I took him to the camp chaplain who offered to counsel me on what had happened as well, but I didn't want to talk about it. The one time I asked M later about it, he said out of nowhere he had gotten this feeling telling him he needed to leave now. Something primal. A primal feeling almost like he said. He didn't say anything to me because he thought it was strange too but had decided he just wanted to leave. I still don't know what I saw that day, but it scared the shit out of me. I had more creepy stuff happen the next week there, and my little brother worked there for two summers as well and had some strange stuff happen. If you guys want me to share more of these things that me and my brother have experienced, let me know. I just figured I'd share this one because it was my first paranormal experience, and one of the most vivid and terrifying I've had. More Paranormal Experiences The last paranormal event I witnessed at the camp, and coincidentally the last time I've been at said camp, took place about a week after the event I recounted my last experience. Myself and about four other staffers were in the lower field, about 75 yards from the mouth of the river trail enjoying a fire. We had snuck down to smoke cigarettes. While we were sitting there that night, the fireflies around the mouth of the trail were starting to flash red. At first, just a few, then it seemed to be the whole forest in the direction of the river, filled with red flashes. It was somewhat unnerving given what I had seen the week before, but I myself had witnessed these lightning bugs doing this long before that I believed in the paranormal. I smoked another cigarette and joked, just talked and cracked wise about all of our bosses and the way people worked in general. It was just 15 or 16 year olds doing their thing, lost in conversation for 10 minutes or so. We all failed to notice our friend, who we'll call Kay, standing away from the circle, facing the river trail. I saw her out of the corner of my eye, but just figured she was taken back by the fireflies. She had never seen them or something. About 30 seconds later, I glanced at her and saw her still standing there. I walked over to check on her and noticed her head was tilted slightly upwards, looking up toward Antenna Pine. For those who didn't read my last post, it's a large pine tree that just sits atop a ridge three and a half miles up from the camp across the river. When standing nearly anywhere with an unobstructed view, you can see the pine from the camp. I followed her gaze up to the pine and I was blown away. There was what could have been, or rather couldn't have been more than a hundred feet away from the top of the pine was a bright red light. At first I thought it was a rescue helicopter, maybe recovering someone from the top, but there was no sound. 
We had had rescue helicopters land before in the field that we were standing in, and the way to the bluffs and the valley work along the buffalo. Sound travels extremely far. I also quickly ruled out the rescue helicopter quickly because there were no campers as it was the weekend. The only ones with access to the antenna pine trail are the Boy Scouts. And any time someone goes missing or gets rescued at the camp's property, the camp director is immediately notified, and this never happened. This object orbited above the pine slowly. I was unable to accurately judge the speed, but it was too slow to be a plane. So we sat watching this object for about seven minutes or so. It would occasionally speed up or down, very gradually, and it wasn't super noticeable. Someone in the group with us then said that he was going to go wake up all the other staffers just to see it and bolt it up to the hill behind us. Almost immediately after my buddy had got up to get more onlookers, the object stopped dead in its tracks about halfway through its orbit of the pine. During this stop, you could make out the cylindrical shape of the object. Shortly before it darts off, almost instantly completely disappearing from sight. We sat out there for another 20 minutes and recounted our story to the few staffers that woke up that believed our buddy. Over these 20 minutes, the fireflies one by one went back to normal, and we all eventually went to bed. I remember being somewhat confused because the last inexplicable thing I witnessed had left me horrified. Not even a week before, and then this... There was no dread, fear, wariness, or angst over it, simply a feeling of wonder and bewilderment. I just hope whatever it was enjoyed the view of the buffalo as much as we had been. The next two stories are my brothers from the same camp, and the last is my most recent involving the fraternity house that I live in. Two summers after my spooky experiences there, my little brother decided he too wanted to spend the summer out there. I was fully supportive of this and was excited for him to go. I gave him the normal, It's haunted over there, you, which he shrugged off. He wasn't quite sure about the paranormal and he'd never really seen anything. However, my parents had told him about his chats with my grandparents after they died when he was a small child recently, so I think it had the gears in his head turning. During his first summer there, he was given the task of guiding our troop on the hike to Antenna Pine. They left late afternoon and reached the top about an hour and a half before sunset. They hung at the top for about 30 minutes admiring the view and then left. On the way down, the troop scoutmaster led the way and my little brother stayed at the end of the group to make sure no kids got lost and he would be sure to be the last one across. He said that as they continued down the mountain he got the feeling that he was being watched. He chalked it up to the people that he was chaperoning. As he continued this feeling, it sort of stuck, and he started to hear footsteps almost matching his. But when he stops and looks back, the footsteps would stop, and there was nothing there. Although this creeped him out, he said nothing and just kept moving. I think he made the group move a little faster, reasoning it was about to get dark. They continued back to the camp, and my brother said he felt and heard this phenomenon the whole way. And while it was almost entirely muted footsteps on the rock trail he heard behind him, he heard twigs crack a couple of times, and he said this scared him the most. They continued down the ridge and finally reached the ford in the river. My brother said that the feeling here was almost unbearable, and he looked into the woods behind them and saw nothing. Still feeling watched, he slowly took off his shoes and began to cross the ford got about halfway across, and he said he was compelled to stop and look back. He said that as he did, a large splash of water rose up at the edge of the river like someone had just taken their first step in crossing. My little brother stood paralyzed before members of our troop calling his name snapped him out of it and just ran back across. And by the way, this was in the summer of 2017. The following summer, he and a friend decided to cross the river to the cabin. This cabin was an original homestead cabin from the Boxley Valley and has been reassembled here at the top of a small waterfall in the 90s to act as a living history exhibit for the camp. They did metalworking and several other pioneer crafts. The cabin had been abandoned since about 1998. I had heard stories of staffers in this cabin being subject to strange paranormal events and one of the staffers who had worked in the cabin had a son working with us. 
Crazy stories, no doubt. Windows and doors slamming, crosses flipping upside down on the wall, pretty standard ghostly story fare. I myself had been there several times, never noticing anything weird, just noting how cool the history behind this thing was. So my little brother and his friend make it to this cabin, and it being a relatively hot day, set their lawn chairs in the creek that feeds the waterfall. On the way up to this cabin, his friend had asked him multiple times if he heard laughing. Well, on the way that he didn't, as he sat there, he said he caught it in earshot from multiple directions the whole time they sat there. However, he never heard it clearly. As they sat there talking, a lull in the conversation left them looking at the area around them. My brother said in this moment he noticed for a split second, and the only thing he could hear was the creek that they were sitting in. And even then, he noted it sounded almost muffled, as he realized the most blood-curdling, bloody murder, loudest scream he'd ever heard ring out. He said it lasted for a good three or four seconds, then stopped, but echoed loudly off the walls of the waterfall below. He and his friend were both terrified. His friend literally fell out of his chair into the creek, and slowly stood up and approached the edge of the waterfall where they had heard the scream come from and peered down, only to see nothing thirty feet below them. No rustling from an animal or a person running, simply nothing. That was the last time my little brother went across the river, and the next summer he worked at a different camp altogether. The last experience I have to recount is recent, and multiple variations of it have happened over the past three and a half years. I live in a fraternity house that was built in 1920, it was constructed as the first female housing on our campus, and had seen a couple of owners before a fraternity purchased it in 1971. When I moved in in the fall of 2018, all the members told me the house was haunted, that Jake would sometimes make himself known. I was of course somewhat skeptical, as I thought it was just the older brothers to give me a spook, but first time I knew Jake existed happened about three months after I moved in. Our entire chapter left the house at about 1am for activities. I ran upstairs after they left and put running shoes on to catch up with them. I sat on my couch and began tying my shoes quickly when a large stomp outside my door scared the shit out of me, followed by footsteps moving away from the door. I stood up and opened the door expecting to yell screw you at one of the brothers, however, upon opening the door I saw nothing, just heard footsteps moving away from me down the hallway. I knew someone was there, but I couldn't see a damn thing. The footsteps completely stopped at the wall at the end of the hall, and I just stepped back in my room, locked the doors, and went to bed. I asked my fat brothers the next morning, frat brothers the next morning, and they all asked where I had been. I told them what happened and that I thought one of them must have pranked me. They told me that I was the only one there. At first I didn't believe them, but I had literally watched every single one of them leave. The house also has the original hardwood floors throughout, which are by no means quiet. You can hear just about anyone going anywhere in this house, so I'd have heard doors open and stairs creaking, etc. For anybody that's still hanging on there, thanks for listening and sorry for a couple of those mistakes. If you know what that one word means that I couldn't figure out, let me know, because I'm not exactly the opposite of bright, but I certainly don't know every word in the book. So, as always, have a good night. See ya. Welcome fellow truth seekers to Paranormal M. Subscribe and enable notifications to stay updated on our thought-provoking stories that explore the mysteries of the unknown. Enjoy the exploration. So this happened when my sister and I were in high school. We rented out this semi-detached house for a few years with our mom, dad, and eight-year-old brother at the time. It was a newish area, and it was a pretty family-friendly neighborhood. Our house always gave me weird vibes in general, but I had no idea why. It was kind of small and the layout was weird. When you walked into the kitchen area from the living room, you had the actual kitchen, 
the stove, the fridge, the table, all that to the left. Then to the right side of it was carpet, and there was a little electric fireplace that didn't work. Our parents' wedding pictures were hanging on top. We never used that space, so my dad put a Bowflex machine there, which made it even more ugly. Moving on, we bought a dog that year. She would frequently bark in the corner of our room, mine and my sister's. When no one was in there, it was pitch black. When we would go upstairs to see, she would still be barking. It was like a scared territorial kind of bark. As she barked, she would back up at the same time in fear. It was spooky. But I never saw anything, so I was just kind of whatever about it. I also saw my brother come down the stairs in the morning only to have him be sleeping in his room. Now what I'm about to write is still unexplainable to this day. Our parents still don't believe us. We were all hanging out in the kitchen, my sister, brother, and I, when suddenly we look on the wall in the weird carpet area, and there was a ginormous spider crawling on it. It was probably tarantula-sized. We lived in Canada, so this is not normal for us. We were both like, oh my god, let's take a picture of it because nobody's going to believe us. So my sister whips out her phone, and it won't turn on. Never happened before. So I was like, whatever. I'm going to go upstairs quick and get mine. So I jolt up the stairs and come back down quick. As I was coming down, I just see the rest of the spider's body as it disappeared behind my parents' wedding picture on the wall. The thing is... We inspected this picture and it was literally flat against the wall. There's no way anything, especially a spider that big, could fit behind it. We were so confused and still are to this day. We've had a few weird experiences afterwards, but nothing crazy after leaving that house. My sister and I shared a weird dream once, and that's kind of where it ended. Ghost Preacher and Attacking Shadow Entity Long Story I was raised in a family that never once dismissed the paranormal. In fact, we all kind of reveled in it. I mean, hell, I remember at eight years old my freaking grandma bought me my first ever ghost book. It was called The Everything Ghost Book. So needless to say, I was pretty much always a weird kid. My family had always been superstitious and even quote-unquote sensitive to a point. My mom would always say things like, and this is in quotes, I have a feeling I'm going to see quote-unquote person today, and she would always run into them somehow. My first real experiences start 10 years ago when I was just 16 years old. My mom had found a cheap foreclosed house in a ridiculously small town called Ponce de Leon in Missouri, or as I like to call it, Missouri. <laughs> Naturally, she fell in love with the house. My mom, my older sister, and I moved in not long after. I was homeschooled at this time, and I was not happy about moving to such a small rural area. And when I say small, I mean I could literally walk to the town post office right around the corner as well as the town church. Not to mention you had to drive up a few hills to even get cell reception. Although I didn't share my mom's excitement about the move, the quaint town was kind of beautiful. It had a strange little cemetery and many natural springs and waterfalls, as the town name suggests. Upon doing recent research of the town, I found this little blurb on Wiki. And this was how the town got its name, and why people around the town joked about the water's healing powers. The community was founded circa 1875 as a health resort to exploit the mineral spring at the location. The resort was named for the explorer, Juan Ponce de Leon. The resort and town prospered, and with a population of around 1,000, it was the largest town in the county. We soon realized after moving in that the neighbors were pretty close-knit. Upon conversation with one of them, my mom had found out a few things about the house. It was built in the 1950s, 
And in the 1980s, they started to add on to it, and it was turned into a Baptist preacher's parsonage, excuse me, or a church house provided for a member of the clergy. This is the same preacher that spoke at the church right up the road. It was later sold to the prior buyers, then foreclosed, and that's when we got it. Nothing more was said of what happened to the preacher. Now, pretty much immediately after we moved in, we started to update the house. We did flooring, painting, and all the things that come with buying an older house. We hadn't experienced anything unusual during this time. After we had gotten settled in and all the renovations ceased, I invited my friend over to show her the new house. This is when my first experience happened. I started showing her around the kitchen, the living room, bathrooms. And that was because I was saving my bedroom for last. As soon as I started to push my bedroom door open, we heard an object scrape across the tile of my bedroom directly towards us. I looked all around, and that's when I saw a little LED book light by my feet. It's important to note that I strictly remember wedging that book light between two heavy books on my bookshelf the night before. And that bookshelf was at least 12 feet from my bedroom door. I remember my friend's just face looking tense and uneasy as I tried to explain. I even marched over to my bookshelf and tried to understand the logistics of how it could have just even happened. Truthfully, there was no way I could explain it. And frankly, the fact that it was thrown in my direction specifically made me feel super anxious. That event seemed to be the catalyst. Strange things started happening to not only me, but my family as well. When we started opening up about the whole ordeal as a family, all three of us started to realize that we all shared all these experiences. One we all heard when walking down the same hallway was a man's deep voice saying, Hey, in a rushed, loud tone. Anyone who's heard any kind of voice phenomenon knows that it's so strange because it sounds as though it's directly in your ear canal. It's unlike anything else. Another common occurrence that we shared was in the bathroom at night. When we had to wake up and pee, we all recounted hearing heavy footsteps. Almost like a man in boots. Footsteps. Approaching the closed bathroom door. The steps would stop right outside the bathroom door and you could bend down and see the shadow of feet underneath the door. Then they would walk away. We also frequently heard the front door opening only to find that it was fully closed. At one point, my mom, being sensitive as I mentioned earlier, was lying in her bed at night, just about to drift off when she got a strange feeling come over her. She got the image in her head of an older male. She mentioned that he had an angry face and you could just feel this feeling of anger and hostility. I think she came to the assumption that it could have possibly been the preacher, although we have no proof of this. If it was him, I can certainly tell you he did not like me one bit. This is where my story and experiences turn a little bit darker. We had lived in the house for about a year now or so, and the summer started to come around. I decided I wanted my own space and moved out to the separated garage space. It was a huge space that we never kept the cars in anyway. I remember completely making the space my own. I bought huge curtains, painted the cement walls, got a mini fridge, bought a TV, PS2, and most importantly, all my music equipment. I've always been a music lover and devoted a lot of my time to playing electric guitar in my early teens. This is something that followed me. Right about this time is when I found my love for classic rock, but what really intrigued me was its dark history. It had gotten to a point where my mom and sister barely saw me in the house anymore. I had basically become a hermit in the garage, playing music and delving deep into research on my laptop. One figure in classic rock I was particularly engaged in was Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. 
According to a lot of books and articles, he was into the occult and followed English occultist Aleister Crowley. I often found myself falling down a rabbit hole and I started to feel so disconnected from reality. It was then when I became obsessed with that old idea, you know, the whole sell your soul to the devil and shred like a madman on guitar thing. And one time while practicing, I believe someone or something gave me a small taste of what it would feel like. There was one solo in particular I had tried to play a few times but could never quite hammer down. I had started to practice it again one day and started playing most all the fast-paced solo perfectly, almost without any effort on my part. I all but ripped my guitar strap trying to get my guitar off. It terrified me. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough for me to stop my isolation or research. I didn't touch my guitar for a while, though. My friends that I had then were very like-minded, all very interested in the paranormal, the occult, and otherworldly things. My garage started to be a safe place for all my friends I had, and there were plenty of long nights partying and partaking in things no mom would be proud of, but we were rebellious and pretty defiant teenagers. None of us cared at all at that time. It was around this point I remember almost dreading going into the house when I had to inevitably take a shower or use the bathroom. In a sense, I didn't feel particularly welcome there either. I remember taking a shower one day, listening to Black Sabbath on a nearby iPad. The music kept pausing, so I would reach out and press play again. This happened about three more times when I finally yelled, I know it's you, stop doing that! And it didn't happen again for the remainder of my shower. It could have been a coincidence, or a technical fault for sure, but I remember being so bold toward what I thought was that old preacher man, almost feeling a hatred towards him. One morning when I was still sleeping in the garage, my mom busted through the door and started to throw all my things around. She was screaming, I don't know what the fuck is going on here, but something's got to change. Something's not right. Her voice sounded angry, but I could hear the undertones of fear. Keep in mind, it's not like I had a huge pentagram spray-painted on the exterior of the garage. As far as I knew, she had no clue of what I was looking into, and what I had even been experiencing. The intuition of a loving and concerned mother, I guess. So, she proceeded to rip down my posters, grabbed a random item of mine, and threw them outside the garage door into the lawn. I remember this like it was yesterday because I think it finally hit me how far things had gone. And seeing my mom so upset and ultimately scared, I think knocked some sense into me. It was then that I also moved back into the house as it was turning to fall and started to become too cold to stay in that garage overnight anyways. Ultimately, I purged everything I had that truly had any dark personal significance to me during my move back into the house. The last thing that happened, and probably the worst of all, happened to my sister. The only way I heard her story was by listening to her explaining it to my mom. Even though I was completely moved into the house now, my family still kept their distance. I knew they felt something too. I felt as if I really divided my family. My sister had a job that required her to get up early in the morning, and when it was still dark outside. She was smoking a cigarette on the back porch, which had a direct view of the garage and the steep hill that runs alongside the detached garage. She said she saw a dark mass low to the ground. She first spotted it come from behind the back of the garage, and then it started to charge down the steep hill towards the back porch where she was standing. She expressed to my mom that she had never felt so much fear in her life. She quickly shut the back door. She also said that she didn't believe it was an animal because it was charging towards her. There was absolutely no sound, no paws, hooves, or sound of feet on the soft ground. The house seemed to go quiet after that. No voices, no footsteps. Unfortunately, a few years later, my mom could no longer keep up during a harsh winter. Everything started to break and we didn't have the money to repair things. We couldn't even keep the house warm. 
we decided to up and leave. Most of our belongings were still in the house when we did leave. We came back a few times on warmer days to grab some more of our things and started to see our old home become in a complete state of disrepair. Mold growing absolutely everywhere. Paint starting to peel and all the hard work we had put into it gone. It was harder for my mom to see. It was her first house that she bought and it killed her to just abandon it. It eventually went back into foreclosure. When I turned 20, I got my first apartment, and it had to be blessed twice. I thought everything had gone back to normal at that point. I then met my now husband when I was still in my first apartment. He had no idea of my dark past and admitted to me that he felt something dark in my apartment. One night it had gotten so bad he said that he had to pray over me. I've had two apartments since then and we both don't sense anything inherently dark. Sometimes I still wonder if it's truly left. I got in contact with a good friend who distanced herself from me during that dark time. I would actually consider her my closest friend. She recounts things very differently and said that I had definitely changed. She has a few stories of her own and things that I have said to her that were very unlike my true character. The crazy thing is, I don't remember saying some of these things. I truly don't think I knew how bad it had gotten. The Hooded Figure about ten years ago, when I was in my early teens, I experienced my first, and so far, only paranormal experience. During the summer when this happened, I was visiting my father in Hungary with my two sisters. The night this happened was just like any other night. My grandmother was staying over, and between her, my father, and my sisters, all three bedrooms were taken, leaving me to sleep on the sofa in the living room. My sisters and I had just gotten back from a late night of hanging out with some friends, and we decided to get ready for bed, pretty immediately, since we were all very tired. As I got into my bed for the night, my sisters continued talking quietly in their room with the door open and the lights from their bedroom on. My father and grandmother were asleep. My father's house wasn't creepy by any means. But the one unnerving thing about sleeping in the living room in the dark was the fact that all three doors leading into it had a large panel of frosted, wrinkled glass on the top half. And this allowed you to see fuzzy shapes or figures of people on the other side of the door. This made what I saw all the more mysterious, and at the time, terrifying. Still wide awake, I looked up through the glass of one of the doors, and looking as clear as anything I'd ever seen was a hooded figure staring right at me. Gray and featureless, it was standing on the other side of the door and perfectly backlit by the light streaming out of my sister's room. I immediately froze, unable to take my eyes off of it. The figure was clearly watching me, although it didn't have any eyes or face that I could see. Any defining features were obscured by some type of hood or shawl it wore over its head and shoulders. As I lay there frozen in fear, my mind quickly eliminated all the possibilities of this thing being human. Both my grandmother and my father were asleep, and my sisters were still taking in their bedroom, or, excuse me, talking in their bedroom. Not to mention, why would any of my family just stand there? looking at me without moving in the dead of night. After some time, I finally plucked up the courage to call out to one of my sisters to come, unsure of what else to do. She told me she'd be there soon, leaving me staring at this figure for another terrifying period. Then, just seconds before she was about to step out of her room and through the very same door the figure was standing behind, it glided away and out of sight and my sister walked through as if nothing had even happened. For me, this was the nail in the coffin, so to speak, that I witnessed some type of spirit, ghost, or guardian angel that night. 
The way in which it glided away on the other side of the glass was so unhuman-like in its movement. I know that what I saw that night was something paranormal. I have the cremation ashes of four people in my apartment. Could they be messing with me? About three years ago, my beautiful mom passed away. When she did, I got not only her ashes, but my dad's and my mom's dad's as well. Also, last year my mother-in-law plus son-in-law and two kids moved in with me and brought the ashes of my father-in-law. Now that we're all caught up on why I have so many dead people in the house, for the past year, every month or two, I've woken up to something grabbing my toes. At first, I would jump up and go to the end of the bed thinking that it was my daughter, because who else would it be, but no one would be there. After a few times of this happening, I decided that maybe it was my mom, just saying hello, because she used to wake me up by grabbing my toes that way. So I tried not to freak out when it happened, really. But maybe two months ago, I was in the kitchen, kind of pretty late at night, and I guess somebody left the cupboard open because it was open, and I kid you not, a cup came flying out of the cupboard and nearly hit me. It just flew out. It landed next to my foot. When I told my family what had happened, my son-in-law laughs almost evil-like and says that she think... S-I-L means son-in-law, no? Onward and upward, anyhow. She thinks that it was her dad messing with me because the cup was covered in pictures of butterflies. And any time they feel that they get a message from him, it had to do with butterflies. So, okay, my father-in-law doesn't like me. Then last night I was laying with my daughter, because even though she's ten years old, I still put her to bed at night. I dozed off for an hour or two. Then I just woke up for no apparent reason. Then the covers pulled up my leg crazy fast, and something grabbed a hold of my foot. I was wide awake and not just felt, but saw the covers move. I jumped up so fast I don't even know how I got my arm out from underneath my daughter's head. The thing or ghost or whatever grabbed my foot wasn't cold like I would think a ghost might be, though. It was just like room temperature. What's going on here? This doesn't happen to any of the other six people in my house. People in caps. Just me. Why? Is it my mom grabbing my toes and my foot? My father-in-law throwing a cup at me? Or could it be something else altogether? And, most importantly, should I be scared? One too many experiences. My family and I moved countries when I was young, and the first house we moved to in that country was about 40 years old, owned by a young guy. I can't tell you where, but it's one of the Commonwealth countries. The reason for not disclosing the location is because I want this to remain somewhat anonymous. But I know that people who I've told this story may know who I am. It was a rented property and nothing out of the ordinary other than multiple neighborhood cats roaming around the dying garden with very much dead lawn. When we moved in, we were fine for a few weeks, and then it started. I had a really good relationship with my family, until we moved into that house. Everyone started to pick fights with each other, and when we were living there, nothing ever was going right. Everyone was on edge, the vibe was off. I sometimes saw pearly dusts floating above me at night while laying down on bed. I reasoned it as cars passing by, producing that reflection on the walls or something. But it was still there, even after the cars passed by in the street. I didn't think much of it at the time, and as a kid I just thought we moved to a dusty old house. Then the house would randomly get cold and when it did, it would never get warm, despite the three portable heaters in the same room. And scarily enough, they were all functioning fine. 
and where it would get cold in the house would vary every time. At the time, we just thought that the construction of the house was old and maybe we had thin walls or the heaters were all defective. Then one day I saw it. Before I get into details, I want you to imagine this corridor right in the middle of the house surrounded by bedrooms and bathrooms. Basically, this corridor had no natural light, and it was very, very dark if all the bedroom doors were closed. Going back to this encounter, I was in the bathroom washing my hands, and as I opened the bathroom door to exit, I see this fog. And this fog resembles a human arm moving back and forth as if it was walking. It disappeared at the end of the corridor. A full arm stretching from shoulder to the tips of the fingers, moving as though attached to an invisible body, resembling a brisk walk in that dark corridor. It couldn't have been some light coming outside from the windows, because it was in the corridor that did not have any natural light available. Plus, it was daytime. Only after this encounter I felt the shiver down my back. A genuine shiver that you get when you see something that you can't logically process. I didn't share these encounters with my family back then, because I didn't want to scare anyone, and I was in doubt with the experience. When we found a new place and moved out of that house, I finally felt ready to share this experience with my family. Jokingly saying that the house was haunted. I only got to know then that everyone had the same experience. Seeing something in the air, nightmares, a ghastly arm, cold spots. My mom would have nightmares of this black shadow trying to enter into the house while she would hold them back out. My sibling who also saw the arm told me that while the arm was moving away, exactly the same way I've described above, he swears that the temperature in that corridor must have dropped in that moment as he could see his own breath. I feel like this whole thing could be explained due to stress of moving to a new country. I don't know. I'm just thankful that we were only renting it out temporarily and that we were able to leave. From Guardians to Unwanted Guests I grew up as a mixed-race, mixed-culture child my mother being a black female and my father a Native American. Traditionally, Natives are very in tune with the spiritual world. My mom, not so much. Mostly holding that good old Christian belief system and often referring to my dad's spiritualism as his quote-unquote crazy Native beliefs. However, I've always connected to ghostly entities and keep quiet for the most part not wanting my mother to refer to me the same way as him. I often called these entities my guardians when I was a child, because whenever I did something stupid or unsafe, they, or some of them, would protect me. So I literally grew up not fearing the supernatural. Now, so you can understand why I'm so comfortable as a child... I'll elaborate a little on my interactions. I was a latchkey kid, so after school I would walk home, lock myself into the house, and then went about my day, feeding myself, doing my homework, and watching TV. It wasn't uncommon for an elderly woman's spirit to often sit down on the couch with me until my nana, my grandmother, got home from work. It wasn't until my teen years that I realized that the elderly woman was my great-grandmother who had passed away six years before my birth. Throughout my lifetime, I've interacted with many spirits. Most stuck in a loop, a couple I could interact with, and the one that still terrifies me to this day. I had just finished my senior year of high school, and I had applied to a local community college. I was one of those students who balanced between poor enough to file for financial aid, but wealthy enough that I didn't get much. Not enough to pay for all my classes and books. So, 
I started house-sitting our family and friends' animals to pay the rest. My mother's previous boss was one of those people. She loved traveling and would often do, you know, this about two or three times a year for at least a month. She was retired at the time. She lived in a rural area, with one neighbor close enough to contact just in case of emergency. I had been to the house twice before when I was a child, and both times I was unsettled. My mother's boss, let's just call her Amy, was a teenager during World War II, and was placed in danger because of her parents' open objection to Hitler. So they fled to America. She's a photographer in her spare time, and she adores Mexico, and at the time was looking to move there. And with that said, she had hundreds of masks hanging on her walls, all throughout her house accompanied with photos that she took of cemeteries and gravestones. For a couple of years, I experienced small things and voices, dragging noises. Periodically, things would have been moved. Nothing too terrifying, but when I started dating an old friend, I had him staying with me just to have an immediate backup, if something were to happen. When this happened, I was 21. My boyfriend had expressed some discomfort in being in the house, especially at night, to which I told him about the multiple spirits I had encountered there. I mentioned that none of them have been hostile, and as long as we left them alone, they would leave us alone, with the exception of the screaming man. He liked to stand outside of the window and scream around three in the morning, and I simply would ask him to quiet down. We were playing games on the second week of our stay. When my significant other had to use the bathroom, I opted to char or change into my jammies while he went off into the darkness. When he screamed very loudly. Now my significant other isn't easily scared, but he hightailed it back into the living room. He said that the dark entity that often stood beside the homeowner's bedroom door, which happened to also be next to the hall that led into the house from the cars, had turned and looked at him. It paused before getting bigger and started running towards him. Very strange behavior for the being. But I assumed that we had upset it, so I apologized for bothering it. From then on, my significant another and I went to the bathroom together during the night. Fast forwarding to last week, things had gotten a bit tenser. Each entity started getting more and more agitated, until it seemed like our nights were filled with activity, and our space seemed to shrink until it was the single bedroom. I kept my keys on the coffee table in the living room my computer for school in the family room, and a few toiletries. Those objects would appear back in my bedroom, as if someone carelessly tossed them in. Spirits I had no problems with started running away or charging at me. Eventually I took my significant other home to see if things slowed down. They didn't. By the time my two-month house-sitting job was done, I was exhausted and cranky. I left the house at ten at night, being that the family would be back around four in the morning, and during the long drive on the dirt road, a childlike figure slowly walked across. I paused, seeing the same dark shadow that guarded the entrance to the home, and watched as it ran across the road, taking the child figure away with it. After a second, I continued on my way home, not wanting to slow to a slop, to a stop, or leave the vehicle to investigate. Four days afterwards, I was chilling at my house, finishing up my finals. My grandmother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and a dog were in the bedroom behind me. My grandfather was at his aunt's funeral in Bermuda, and my mom was in California for business. I say this because I need you to understand, I was essentially alone and the only one awake. The sounds of someone dropping and dragging a large box echoed from down the hall. My grandparents have an ensuite bedroom. 
They had their own living room space, where I was doing my homework, a bathroom, a closet, and a bedroom that hid behind a door, one that was closed. I paused in my essay, suddenly feeling the familiar unease that I associated with Amy's house. The dragging sounds never left. What I assumed was my kitchen, and I by no means went to investigate. But I had never had a spirit follow me home, and that night I didn't sleep because that spirit didn't wish me well. When I did come out in the morning, I found my house-sitting bag torn open with all my house-sitting gear tossed about. It's safe to say I never house-sat for Amy again, and I hadn't experienced anything outside of the norm of what goes on at my house since. But there have been points that I can feel the hairs on my arms raise like I'm being watched when I'm at other houses. I played with my dead grandfather in my dreams as a child. So I never knew my grandfather. He passed away two months before I was born. He died in November of 96, and I was born in January of 97. And I'm the only grandchild that he didn't get to meet in person. So growing up, I always knew who he was, and I always assumed it's because I was told who he was when I was little, until I was 15. So I'm at a hospital visiting someone who just had a baby, and somehow the topic of dead relatives visiting people in dreams comes up. My mother proceeds to tell a story of when my grandfather visited me when I was little. I got so emotional at 15 I had to leave the room and the hospital entirely to collect myself after the story was told. The story goes like this as my mother told it. I was playing in the living room one day while my grandma was looking at photo albums. I was maybe three at the time. And I walked over to my grandma as she's looking at a picture of her late husband, and I say, That's the man that plays with me in my dreams. My grandmother responds, What? I continue to repeat what I said before, but I add, Before he leaves, he kisses me right here and tells me to be good. I gesture to the middle of my forehead in between my eyebrows. This is where my grandfather kissed all of his grandkids before telling them bye something I would have never known unless I was told or experienced it myself. My grandmother freaks out and calls my mom at work and asks her if she'd ever mentioned Herman, my grandpa, to me. My mother responds no and says, The only thing I've told him is that daddy is his guardian angel and he'll always look after him. And I told him that the day that he was born. My grandma proceeds to tell my mom to come home, so she does. Once my mom arrives home, my grandma pulls up to her side and asks her a bunch of questions, then brings her into the living room where I'm just doing three-year-old things. She then pulls me over and says, Tell mommy what you told me about this man, as she points to the picture of my grandpa, and I respond, That's the old man that plays with me in my dreams. Before he leaves, he kissed me right here. I gestured to the middle of my forehead between my eyebrows once more. My mother and grandmother are now both freaking out as I continue to play with my toys. That's where the story ends. As far as I've been told, my mom never mentioned to me who my grandfather was other than that what she told me when I was born. I've always known who he was and that he had this weird connection with me. I guess since he never got to meet me, he made up for it in this way. He's the reason for my obsession with music. He was a traveling bluegrass musician in Kentucky. I was raised hearing stories of him singing and playing guitar. I've idolized him my entire life, so that story was very emotional for me to hear. A haunting at a fire department, or faulty pipes. This all happened when I was a kid. I'm 23 now and it still gives me chills. Okay, so I'll jump right into it. 
Both of my parents were volunteer firefighters, and I practically grew up in a fire station around all sorts of first responders. This fire station was connected to one of the county police department offices, which was a small four-room office upstairs with two entrances, a door that led outside, and another that led downstairs to the bay where the fire trucks were. Everything seemed normal and fine, until a friend of my cousin and my cousin's husband, an EMT, used a Ouija board to try to talk to an officer that had just died a week before. So let me give you a rundown on this cop real quick before I get into the paranormal stuff that started happening after his death and the Ouija board use. So from what I remember of him, which isn't a lot, he was a pretty crooked cop. He would arrest people in the small town for drug possession. Then he would give the drugs to his son after they'd been processed into the system and counted, so his son could sell them and they'd split the profit. Nasty. This goes on for years and there's rumors but no proof of who was stealing the drugs until he died. This officer had a surgery and was taken stolen pain meds and accidentally OD'd. They found his body and a large amount of stolen drugs in his home. So now on to the paranormal. So my cousin told me about them using the Ouija board there. This officer's death was recent. So them doing this to talk to him, well to me, a kid who loved horror movies, was super cool and fascinating. The one key detail I do remember from the story that my cousin told me was that they asked the spirit who was there and the spirit whispered to the officer and told him his name into his ear. For a while I thought my cousin was messing with me to scare me until a few months later I had an experience there. So I was about 10 when this happened, maybe 12 the oldest. I used to go work out with my parents at the fire station because I was a chunky kid and the family doctor rode my parents' ass to get me to lose weight. Well, one night we had finished working out, my parents get a tone to the firehouse, and my mom agreed to stay there with me until my dad got back. So we're sitting there watching old training VHS tapes on the TV in the dark, and we hear loud stomping upstairs. My mom and I immediately froze and looked at each other, because we thought it was just us there, and we're pretty sure it is just us. It was bizarre. The stomping would start in one room, then stomped to the other. Filing cabinets would open and slam, doors would open and slam, almost as if it was looking for something. Then the stomping got to the middle of the room and stopped. It was so quiet you could hear a needle drop. The way this fire station was set up, there was a ramp that went down to the bay where the trucks were, so my mom and I are sitting there in silence, just listening and we hear the door to the bay open and someone walking up the ramp. My mom got up, went to open that door that looked out into the hallway at the ramp, and nothing was there, not a soul. But as clear as day, we heard a person walking up that ramp. Moments after that, every sink in the downstairs bathroom turned on, all eight of them. And I know someone will say that it could be faulty pipes, but do faulty pipes turn all the knobs on on the sink? I don't think so. This all took place in the span of 10 or 15 minutes, too. We turned off the sinks, and shortly after, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, my dad and all the other firefighters piled into the fire station. My mom and I told my dad and everyone else what was happening, but what do you know, they didn't believe us. They told us we were making it up and we were hearing things. Ever since the Ouija board was used there, the feeling of that place is just weird and creepy. Where before it seemed very familiar and welcoming, like a place of safety. My experience with premonitions. I'm 27, and I've been experiencing significant experiences and premonitions since about five years old. Although my earliest vivid memory of a weird experience is when I was eight. When I was five or six, I just feel like I had really weird dreams. 
Something happened around that age range for me, but I don't know what. Age 8. Simply, I had a dream where a regular day happened, and then that day repeats itself. I always had a hard time getting up in the morning, so my mom yelled from a different room that I need to get up. I wasn't getting up. Then my grandmother helped me up so my mom wouldn't get too upset with me. I finally sit up, slowly waking up and still dazed. So, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment. It was me, my mom, and my grandma. My bed was in my grandmother's room, since it could fit two beds, while my mom had her own, yet smaller room. I have to walk past my mom's room to get to the living room, and while walking past, my grandmother says something to me. I can't remember what exactly, and so did my mom. Fast forward to school now. I can't remember specifics about the day, but the key part is that our class was especially loud and talkative, which annoyed our teacher. So we were threatened with recess being lost if we kept being loud. She walked out of the class to handle something in school, and so we had at it. We started off at a good volume, but over time, it got kind of ridiculous and the teacher came back saying that she would hear us from the hallway. Door was closed. And we lost recess. Day ends, back home, and sleep. And then I wake up and the same exact thing started happening. Once my mom yelled at me again the same way in the morning and my grandmother helping me up. I started to notice the patterns, except the moment I had a clear memory of the whole day. So when I walked past my mom's room, I said what my grandmother was going to say, and she looked at me like, how did you know? I shrugged my shoulders in confusion. I wanted to tell her and now wish I did, but I wanted to see if the day was going to end up like my dream. Despite that small moment, Everything proceeded as I saw in the dream. So, cue my mom appearing and I complete her words, too. She was also surprised, but again, I just make it seem like I'm being weird and ignore their questions. Now at school, and I'm for sure living the same day again. I spend most of the class finishing everyone's sentences at times, but no one took any real notice. When the teacher left the room again, I told the class to shut the fuck up or else we'll lose recess. I don't know, a lone eight-year-old kid convinced a class of 23-plus kids to shut up. Better than most teachers, but it happened. I did it just in time because around five minutes later, the teacher walked in and praised us for being quiet. Because she could hear us down the hall at first, but then got quiet as if she knew or as if we knew that she was coming. From there, the day was completely different because we had recess. Ever since then, I'm always having a fear that I would wake up at that same age again, making this all a dream. Thanks, 2020. Age 10. This was my first time having premonitions while awake. I can't remember when exactly, but I know it was spring or summer solstice because I was still in school as this happened during aftercare. I attended a private school that had aftercare where we could play outside or stay in the auditorium or cafeteria room until our parents picked us up. Anyway, it was hot that day and all of us kids are just kicking it. My friends and I are all in the swing that are just facing the back, or sorry, that faces the blacktop where we all usually play board games like dodgeball and all that. There were some kids playing soccer, and all of a sudden I had a vision exactly like that so raven, where I stared blankly and I see what was going to happen with a bright yellow glow and a vignette. And then it went away and I come back to reality. My friends noticed what happened and was asking me what I was looking at. I point to a kid running with the ball and say, he's going to fall in three, two, one. One, and then he fell and flipped over. My friends lose their shit and ask me how I just did that. Of course, it just happened and I'm just as confused. I had a total of five visions that day, but only remember three. The other one was seeing my friends sitting on the playground, trucks getting chased by bees. 
Specifically, I see my friends on the trucks and one of them yells, Nothing's happening! And then they get attacked by bees from a bush. Once again, for this vision, it's happening randomly, but this time I didn't know when it would happen. My friends were all into my vision, so I told her what I saw. So they ran up to the trucks and sat and climbed on them. A couple of minutes go by. And then one of the girls says, Nothing's happening. And then they get bombarded by bees. At that point, we're all convinced that I can see into the future. Last vision was seeing the earth blow up. If it helps, all my vision I had were from my perspective of where I see it, not any other angle. So if it is true, I guess I'll be in a space watching the planet explode. Then again, three of the five visions came true, if I'm correct. I definitely know because I can recall feeling disappointed that not all my visions were accurate. Age 14, which is now. Since around 14, I would have random premonitions strictly in my dreams, and it would be for mundane things like a lunchbox falling on my face when I open a cabinet, or having a specific conversation when walking into a theater. I've become able to discern my deja vus when I experience them because I would intentionally try and remember when it came from a dream or a sequence, and it was actually repeating itself perfectly. And other times, I just sometimes know when something's going to happen, and thus I predicted a lot of personal events or read people perfectly, even though I don't know them. I may have seen a spirit too. Oh, and some kind of winged demon like flying in the sky, but overall premonitions have been the most consistent phenomenon I've experienced throughout my life thus far. My late dad was an exorcist. Discussion. Technically, exorcisms are rituals done by ordained priests. But they did exorcisms with priests, deliverance rituals if without a priest, visited haunted places for research, etc. We had a storage collection of occult items, cases being documented and reviewed by their ministry. They guested in schools, institutions, prisons, talking about the importance of spiritual warfare. My dad also had a meeting with the late Pope John Paul II in Rome back in the early 2000s and appeared in local media from time to time. They also did pilgrimage, local and international, alongside talks focusing on spiritual warfare. I have tons of photos to support this. He was like the Warrens and John Constantine combined. So I'll be focusing on my perspective growing up in a very religious family. A life filled with preternatural and supernatural events. Which also might have led to my father's demise, as per the team of chief exorcist of our archdiocese who handled my dad's case in the end. I'll be going back to some history first as documented by his ministry in the accounts of my uncles and auntie. He grew up with some abilities, as simple as turning the TV on and off using his mind, to being an experienced practitioner of astral projection. With astral projection, he was even able to help the military to locate a plane crash by giving exact coordinates in a rural mountain region here, and identified the bodies by directly speaking with the victims. No survivors, since he worked for that airline, too. With those abilities, a group of cultists, in air quotes, was able to locate and identify my dad, through astral projection as well. Insane. They went to our house and tried to recruit him. He was open arms with them until he felt so much negative energy emanating from these people. He drove them away and he felt he was starting to get possessed, and tried to run over our maid with the car. Now, coincidentally, his priest friend came by, and he was supposed to be a priest, but left the seminary when my grandpa died to take care of my grandma, just to visit him and witness my dad's possession and exorcised him. 
This is when his spiritual path started. After his friend priest left, he had a vision of the roof opening up to the sky and saw Saint Michael the Archangel, an intense light. He drew his sword and reached out to him. My mom and our maid witnessed this, and all were dumbfounded. This happened in the early 1990s. He went soul-searching for 40 days and nights. A holy mountain is where he went, Mount Banahaw, where he met different personalities. Fast forward, all possession cases that our parish, the National Shrine, receives were being led straight to our house. Not just that, local and international cases happened as well that my dad handled in the years that came. Growing up, we were taught to pray exorcism prayers and the rosary, all in Latin since we're susceptible to attacks given my dad's exposure. It was a common occurrence to wake up in the middle of the night to pee and hear someone screaming at our garage where the cases were being handled and would just tell myself, here we go again. Our house also became a gateway for spirits given the exposure of my dad to these entities, a lot really latched to him, good and bad, and also shared a good number of personal paranormal experiences with them. My dad passed away back in 2007 due to kidney cancer. He only had four months to live after being diagnosed, from being normal to his passing. Many ruled out that it was spiritual warfare, because when my dad was already bedridden, Paranormal shit came by storm and was the worst. Five demonic entities were in the house handled by the team of the chief exorcist of Manila. It was crazy. When my dad was also in the ICU, he practiced deliverance on a fellow comatose patient due to an entity harassing this patient in the hospital. I have so many stories to tell. Specific cases and personal experiences being the son of this man. Though when he passed, everything died down. Paranormal and prenatural experiences happened from time to time, but not as often as when it did when my dad was still alive. I'm now an agnostic for personal reasons, but demons are real. Late one night, a little girl appeared behind me, and my friend it was terrifying. I think she might have turned into a dog, too. This occurred when I was 11 or 12. I'm 28 now. I was staying the night at my friend Danny's house, who lived just a few houses down from mine. There was a large pond behind her neighborhood, and we spent a lot of time there growing up. We'd go fishing, ride bikes, explore the small forest. But we really enjoyed catching turtles and tree frogs. Might sound weird, but what can I say? We had somewhat of an obsession with reptiles and amphibians. Another thing I should note is that there was an old Native American trail that went through all the backyards on our street. I wasn't the Trail of Tears, but it was related to it in some way. I don't really remember. Back to the story. I was up late playing video games with Danny, and after a while he wanted to do something else. It was close to midnight, but we decided to go out and try catching some tree frogs. A family that lived in a nearby house had gone on vacation, and they had a perfect backyard for catching frogs. We hopped their fence and started exploring. Almost immediately I started getting a weird feeling. I had the feeling that we were being watched or something was nearby, and there was this odd energy in the air. I don't know how to explain it, but something just felt off. I remember feeling afraid, but I had no reason to be. We had done this kind of thing many times before, and it's never inspired fear. About ten minutes in, we thought we heard the frog saying, Help me! in a croaky, froggy voice over and over again. The weird thing is, we couldn't see any tree frogs with our flashlights, and the yard wasn't that big. They started chanting in unison, and that made it much louder, feeling more than a little creeped out. 
we bolted out of there and went back to the street. Now we were standing under a street light on the street corner across from where the frog house was. I looked up at the light and noticed at least 15 dragonflies attached to each other like a human centipede. They were doing a spiraling motion as they flew closer and closer to the light. It was weird. So we heard and saw two unusual things. But you could possibly explain them away. What happened next, however, made absolutely zero fucking sense. After the dragonflies did their thing and flew away, Danny and I remained standing under that street light. We began talking about the strangeness of the frogs in particular. We both heard them croaking the same phrase, and we were pretty much just saying, what the fuck was that about? At some point during the conversation, I was instantly overcome with the most intense adrenaline rush I've had in my entire life. The feeling of fear without a source while at the frog house was back, but much, much stronger. It was like my fight-or-flight response was signaled for no reason. Once again, everything felt off, and it felt like there was an intense energy all around us making the air heavy. I was terrified, and I found out later that my buddy was feeling the same thing. I became as still as possible, listening intently to my surroundings. I didn't hear anything unusual, but I suddenly began to feel drawn to look at the street behind me. I knew something was there. Whatever was behind me was the source of my fear, and it was putting out overwhelming energy with its presence alone. I hesitantly turned around and looked. I have full body goosebumps just recalling this. In the middle of the street, about 20 yards away from us, there was an ordinary looking five to seven year old girl with long dark black hair wearing a white nightgown. She was sitting Indian style on the street pavement with a doll in her lap, and she was combing the doll's hair with a hairbrush. I was pretty much terrified beyond imagination. I was frozen with fear. I could barely think straight. There was an incredible amount of energy in the air, and I knew something wasn't natural. She looked innocent enough, but I felt like she could snap me in half with a snap of her fingers if she wanted to. Another creepy detail was that she never even looked at us. She kept her head down and focused on her doll. But she definitely knew that we were there watching her. After what felt like an hour, which realistically was probably 15 or 30 seconds, a car turned onto the street and began heading down the hill towards the girl. I remember the headlights getting brighter and brighter as it approached her. You would think maybe I would try to save her real quick, but I legitimately couldn't move. Also, I didn't really expect her to get hit for some reason. I never felt like she was in any sort of danger. Eventually, she became lost in the car's headlights, never looking up from her doll this whole time, by the way. The car just passed right through without any sound of a collision. It stopped at the stop sign 15 feet from us and made a right turn. We took our eyes off of where the girl was as we watched the car turn. When we looked back to where the girl had been, she was gone. Instead, there was a dog on the sidewalk precisely parallel to where the girl was sitting in the street. The dog was looking right at me when I noticed it, almost like it was waiting for me to see it. Then it just turned around and trotted up the hill in the other direction. After a few seconds, the shock wore off and we sprinted back to Danny's house and spent half the night looking out a second-story window toward the street. I don't know what I saw, but Danny saw the exact same thing. I've always felt like there was a reason it happened for some reason, or a reason it showed itself, whatever it was, to us and all people. Last thing. The house in front of where the girl was seen was haunted. I lived on that street for ten years, and four to five different families lived in that haunted house during those ten years. All of them said it was haunted. I have a couple of stories about that too, but this is already way longer than I wanted it to be.
Long update. Talk to friend. Stuff in the woods. Something completely took over the sky during my graduation party, and either everyone is denying it, or no one remembers. I finally got in touch with one of my friends and asked her to remember my graduation party as hard as she could. Before I talked about the event, she remembered it down to the overcast weather, but didn't remember the actual sound itself until I mentioned it. I tried to transcribe her exact words as best as I could while she told me. Yeah, wait, I vaguely remember something like that. I remember a really loud noise like a plane landing, and everyone just being like, what the fuck was that, holy shit, kind of looking at each other, then afterwards brushing it off as a plane since no one knew what it was. But we all looked, and I don't remember seeing anything outside. It shook the entire house down to the nails on the floorboards, though. Everything was rattling like crazy. That same year, 2012, in mid-July, I heard loud bangs coming from the sky late at night. I know it wasn't thunder because it wasn't raining and it wasn't even humid out and hadn't been all day. It definitely didn't sound like thunder either. You know the sound of a dumpster getting slammed back down after it's lifted by a fork truck? It was like that loud, but sounding like it was coming from a small area, directly in front of my neighbor's house. I saw flashes of light right afterwards. It was loud enough that I asked my mom if she had called the neighbors, but she hadn't heard a thing from inside the house. So yeah, that's what my friend said. In my other post, I read that someone else from Eugene, Oregon, the opposite coast as me, I'm in the northeast U.S., experienced similar events later that year in December 2012. A lot of people were suggesting covert government military activity. LRAD and Gabriel's trumpet were amongst a few mentions. Many also reported a general unsettling insidious feeling throughout the beyond of 2012. My thoughts on that are as follows. Could this be government or military activity? I live near a small military base that's used as a weather station and for the local CAP program, pretty much the Air Force ROTC for those unfamiliar. Nothing other than small two to four passenger Cessna planes or the occasional helicopter ever takes off from there. It simply isn't large enough, and I've personally jogged the entire perimeter was in CAP in high school. During my entire 15 plus years living in that house, there wasn't a single aircraft loud enough to hear from the base. One thing that might be unrelated, but it's definitely worth mentioning, is that I also live near a long abandoned Air Force data center. It's in a restricted area deep in the middle of the forest preserve. The buildings have been entirely gutted, but remain standing too hazardous to the environment to be torn down. There's also a ton of large World War II-era storage bunkers along the trail, all locked up tight. I used to hike up there a lot with friends to spray paint and do drugs or other hood rat shit until we started hearing loud bangs at all hours throughout the woods, and it would reverberate across all the trees. One of the final straws for me was one afternoon when my friend and I were up there alone and a small yellow helicopter-looking drone hovered over us, about 150-200 feet in the air. It stayed locked on us even after we noticed it and ran inside one of the buildings to get away. After that, I noticed it started becoming more heavily guarded by intimidating-looking park rangers, literally down to the cartoonishly large white vans and tinted sunglasses. But... I got the sensation that it was being guarded by something else, long before the drone and rangers and any of that. I always felt like I was being watched up there. Something completely took over the sky during my graduation party, and either everyone is denying it or no one remembers. It was a sunny evening in 2012, probably late June. 
I had just graduated high school after a turbulent four years, and my parents let me throw a little get-together in the backyard with friends and family to celebrate. In total, including myself and immediate family, probably 15 to 20 people tops. My dad had just finished grilling all the food and everybody had moved inside to a small screened-in porch area to eat. Just in case it started getting buggy. Clear Shay. Here's where it gets weird part. Everyone was just sitting around eating and talking and in good spirits. Suddenly the sky gets very, very overcast. I live in an area where sudden storms aren't really a thing. And it didn't feel humid, so it didn't seem like a rainstorm of any kind. It was as though someone switched the sky to a flat gray when it had been cloudless and sunny moments before. As soon as I noticed how gray the sky had suddenly become, a horrendously loud noise rang out across the sky. It sounded like a passenger jet engine was landing in our backyard. A hush fell across the entire group, and everyone looked nervously at each other. No one said a word, even my dad, a six-foot-something Norwegian raised by the Air Force vets, looked seriously, genuinely rattled, a look I'd never seen on him before and never have since. The even stranger part, it passed as quickly as it came, and no one spoke about it once the clouds lifted. It was as though time had frozen during that moment, and then everybody went back to normal, sort of. The rest of the night just felt strangely off. Everyone acted kind of robotic, like actors in a play or NPC characters. The air felt tense. No one I've spoken to remembers it. Not my parents, my friends, my family members that were there. Even my sister, who remembers what she was wearing the first day of kindergarten, didn't even remember. Even weirder is that I forgot about it until just now. I only remembered now that my parents are selling the house. I'm sitting alone in an empty house in that exact spot, and the memory just came flooding right back. I remember rushing to the window with my friends to try to get a look, but I straight up don't even remember if I saw anything or not, which freaks me out that my own memory is so spotty. Greetings, seekers of the Uncharted from Paranormal M. Join us on an adventure into the inexplicable. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to be part of our latest enigmatic tales. Happy exploring. Creepy Christmas. Potential Paranormal Visit. So due to having a family that don't really celebrate Christmas, due to religious reasons, I often spend Christmas with my girlfriend and her family. In my girlfriend's room at the top of her wardrobe is a music box, which was a gift from her mother from Christmas years ago, I believe. It's just a little wind-up music box that you twist and it plays We Wish You Merry Christmas. Anyway, we'd all done the standard opening of the presents, pulled some crackers, said Merry Christmas, etc., etc., then me and the girlfriend and her mom went upstairs to put the presents somewhere out of the way. My girlfriend's mom was talking about her own mother who died a few years ago and how she loved Christmas and wished that she could still be there with them all. Straight after that, this music box starts going off on top of the wardrobe, way too high for anyone to have reached and turned, and nobody had even been near that part of the room. Also, interestingly, my girlfriend's room was previously her grandmother's room, and my girlfriend only moved into the room after the death of her grandmother. My girlfriend's mother believes it to be a message from her own mother, letting them all know that she's still with them. We're all not sure, but it was interesting timing nonetheless, and I have no idea how it would have been set off otherwise. Video Chat Ghost I had a friend I made in Indonesia while I worked in Jakarta. I was chatting to her one night via Yahoo Messenger with the video on. 
This was back in 2010, a few months before I met my wife. I'd been chatting to her for some time, and at some point I noticed a girl behind her sitting on the floor. She was just chilling out, smiling with legs bent in front of her. I was really amused because my friend had been chatting to me for some time, and turns out she's been ignoring her friend the whole time. So I teased and say, Hey, a head just popped up behind you. Expecting her to say, Oh, that's my friend such and such. She's just hanging out. Instead, she says, What head? I'm alone. And I say, There's a girl with glasses behind you. She looks totally freaked out now. I joked that she had a ghost, but I didn't mean it. It just looked like an ordinary young woman. And it kind of looked like the woman ducks down and then is gone. I ask my friend to get up so I can see her room and it's empty. She says she's totally alone. My friend looks really frightened and I try to calm her down and I say it might have been imagining things. But I only said it to calm her down because she looked so scared. It was late, but at that time I regularly went to bed late and I felt pretty awake. Mostly because text chatting always makes me a bit nervous for some reason. Then she says that three of her other friends told her that they can see a girl in her house. But she never seen the girl herself. They all described her as wearing glasses. Except everyone who says that she's wearing different clothes. One, and it actually two, say that it's a red dress another a dark blue shirt, and for me she was wearing a white sort of blouse shirt and pants. Her glasses are big and square, and she looks like she's in her late teens or early twenties. Indonesians can be hard to age for me. Anyway, she tells me she basically didn't take any of her other friends seriously at all. Indonesians can be a bit superstitious. For example, I had an Indonesian colleague who was training to be some sort of shaman and my friend was not into any of that stuff, did not believe in ghosts or have any real religious beliefs. I didn't believe in ghosts either, and if she hadn't looked so freaked out and told me about her friends, I might have put it down to a hallucination. The only thing was that the video window was quite small, but the picture was clear, it wasn't glitchy or blocky. It would be weird if my imagination overlaid a hallucination so perfectly to appear partially obscured by my friend's desk on the floor behind her. The funny part of the story is that we both thought the other person was lying. I thought she was lying about there being nobody in the room, and she thought I was lying and didn't believe that I saw someone. Nevertheless, the fact that I saw this girl independently of her other friends, each of the other three also saw the girl independently of each other, intrigued my friend and so she asked me questions about her. Although I only kind of saw her briefly, I still remember exactly what she looked like. The next time I chatted to my friend on a different day, we talked about it again. Apparently she asked more questions of her other friends. She had a friend that claimed to be a psychic that supposedly communicated with the ghost, and the ghost said that she liked it in the house and that she was kidnapped murdered there, back when the area used to be farmland. My friend lived outside of Jakarta in a place called Deepak. I don't know if I believe any of this bit. I only know what I saw and what I saw just appeared to be an ordinary young woman, totally solid, not transparent or anything like that. I went back to Jakarta as part of the Southeast Asian holiday with my wife and met up with a friend. I asked her again if she was playing a joke on me, and she still claimed she wasn't, and we chatted about it again. If she's playing a prank on me, one, she's an amazing actor. She really looked scared and I said there was a girl in her room. Two, she improvised the story about her friends also seeing a girl really quickly. And three, it really wasn't her style of humor. It made me more open to the idea of ghosts. Being scientifically trained, I still have it in my mind that I might have just been, you know, the victim of a joke or a trick, maybe a trick of my own mind. I kept the transcript of the text chat. It still strikes me as very genuine on my friend's behalf. 
It's a shame I couldn't save the video. And even if I could at the time, I don't think I was seeing anything unusual, apart from the fact that I thought my friend was being really rude and ignoring a guest. I'll post the transcript, but there are bits of it I find cringy because we had a running joke that we sort of jokingly flirted with each other, but it only makes sense in the context of our friendship, so it's a bit embarrassing. Stories from a Church Custodian This church has been in the same location for nearly 200 years. Although the buildings have been updated, you can't go in the church outside of normal operating hours or in small groups without having an experience. I have several stories that I'd like to share, but I'll start with the first thing that happened to us. This takes place when we were around 12 or 13 years old. My friend, David the custodian's son, and I were at the church helping to set up for an event that was to take place later in the evening. While we weren't alone completely, there was only a handful of people in the building, all of whom were on the ground floor. We were tasked with the mission of retrieving a roll of tape from the second floor, so we take a shortcut through the back of the church that has a very narrow staircase that leads directly into the sanctuary. Our destination is the secretary's office, which is right beside the sanctuary. As we're walking through the sanctuary, we both hear what sounds exactly like a loud heartbeat, coming from no particular area. We run out of the sanctuary before even getting the tape and try to figure out where the sound may be coming from. Coming up with the conclusion that it was a supernatural thing considering that there's no type of instrument in our church that could have made it, and it was too loud to be coming from the ground floor where everyone else is. Fast forward a few weeks ago, and we're having a gathering at the church. The area where the previously mentioned staircase is, and has always been a popular place for kids to play, it's out of the way. So I'm in there with the kids because most of them are my cousins, and I like to pick on them. They were all daring each other to go into the small storage area that's underneath the staircase. My youngest cousin, about five, crawls out from under the stairs and says that he saw something underneath them. I ask him what it is, to which he replies, I saw a beating heart. He's never heard me talking about hearing a heartbeat, so it gave me chills hearing it. I've also never considered him someone to have a wild imagination either. May have been a coincidence, but with all the experiences I've had in that church, I'm tempted to believe him. Stories from a Church Custodian, Volume 2 So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, which is beside the staircase mentioned in my first story, and the baptismal, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is a little bit more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel in an otherwise clean hallway. My friend has told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had a key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me not being a big basketball person was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I was interested in joining. 
I arrived a few minutes later and we went in. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises. But some of these noises are very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies puts his phone on the voice recorder and sits in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're all wandering about the rest of the building hoping to record some of the noises that we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path that we had just taken over and over. On our second go-around is when we notice something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was is that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continue on this path maybe three or four more times. Each time the broom has been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decide that it's been long enough so we go check on the phone that my buddy had in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording when we realize how stupid of an idea it was because we couldn't tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we heard a loud tap that sounded like it was coming from a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, then one more tap even closer. Finally, there was what sounded like, exactly like a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decide to check on the broom one more time. As we reach the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway. Two, there's wet paper laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us, and that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple years later, and one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway lays a wet paper towel. Tales from a Church Custodian, Volume 3 The first story is about the parsonage that's beside the church. For those of you who may not know, a parsonage is a house close to the church that the pastor lives in. Anyway, at the time that this happened, we had a temporary pastor who had been living in the parsonage for a little over a year. The pastor had a son who was my age and told me and my friend this story. While living in the parsonage, he always had a bad feeling just from being in there. His bedroom was in the basement where this story occurs. One day, our pastor goes into the basement to retrieve something from one of the storage areas. When he opened the door to the storage room, he was chased from the basement by a single crow. How the crow, if that's what it really was, got into the basement and then into a closed room is still a mystery to me. The second takes place in the ground floor bathroom. In this bathroom is a storage closet that has an unfinished floor that's just dirt. Pretty common in basements. This area is occasionally called the portal to hell by some of the kids my age due to the uneasy feeling that you get from being around it. As I was washing my hands, the door to the closet was pulled open fast enough to make wind. Luckily, I was only washing my hands because... I was out of the bathroom in a second flat. The third story takes place in the second floor bathroom. This bathroom butts up against the storage and maintenance room. During a gathering at the church, I went to an unoccupied area of the church to do my business, as it were, because I'm a gentleman. Anyway, as I was sitting there, I heard a loud scratching sound coming from the cinder block wall right behind my head. Trying to stay calm, I told myself something had tipped over in the maintenance room and that's what made that noise. I finished up and decided to look into the closet. 
the door, which was normally locked, opened right up to reveal that there was nothing in the room that had tipped, nor was there anything that could have even produced that noise in the first place. Stories from a Church Custodian, Volume 5 My friend David and I were at the graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, so we decided to take him to the church that night, and we knew nobody else would be there. We get to the church around 9 p.m., unlock the doors, and go in all the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear the footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing, halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person, at this point, her friends decided that he's got enough proof to believe her stories and was ready to leave. We're standing in the parking lot, facing the door, arguing over who's going to go back inside and turn off all the lights, when all of a sudden there are three distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery's on the second floor and on the side of the building that we were facing. And that made the decision about turning the lights out a bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated having to go in the nursery while she was alone, due to the feeling that she got in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up. Paranormal Parish I was not raised in a religious family. I like to think of myself as an analytical person and try to rely on evidence for most of my beliefs. Growing up in Midwestern Michigan, there was a time in my adolescence that I'm sure many people experience, a time when I was looking for some place to belong. While many teenagers drive their parents nuts by surrounding themselves with drinking and drugs, my rebellion was in the form of a church in my hometown. It had a pretty robust youth group, and they accepted me quickly. It was a safe place. A community that acted like a family that I could confide in. I threw myself into it and spent a few years being embroiled in everything they did, so much so that my parents questioned whether I was involved in a cult. This prolonged encounter with the church was an important step along my personal development and would also become the catalyst for one of the most frightening moments in my life. This was during a mission trip that we took to Sarasota, Florida in the summer of 1997. Sarasota is a small city with a population of a little more than 50,000 people. The city was very socioeconomically divided being populated by the very rich and the very poor. The mission trip was located at a modest Baptist church within the city. The purpose was to conduct a vacation Bible school, a VBS, for the children that lived in the neighborhood, mostly economically disadvantaged youth. I knew nothing else about the church. We were given no information about the congregation or beliefs ahead of time. The only background provided was that our youth pastor, David, made contact with this small church and agreed to donate our time to help coordinate the VBS program. I was relatively close with several of the people on the trip. However, we were joined by a student who was not part of our youth group named Alvin. I do not remember exactly why he came, as I was never close to him but I remember being told that Al's mother wanted him to be a Christian in contrast to their Asian American heritage. 
an idea at the time that seemed to be pretty disinterested in. A dry, straight-laced young man, he was almost the opposite personality of my friends and me. Largely immature, outgoing goof-offs looking for attention. Nevertheless, he attended the trip with the rest of us. We all loaded onto the bus and headed south. We arrived in Sarasota, got to work, and the first part of the trip was pretty uneventful. Nothing seemed unusual. We worked, teaching certain classes ranging in topics that a normal, non-denominational Christian Sunday school would usually teach. It wasn't until the last couple of days of the trip where things started going off the rails. Close to dusk, the second to last day of the trip, our group was outside playing kickball with the children while we waited for their parents to pick them up. It was a hot summer day in Florida, so many of us Michigan kids were not used to the humid hot evenings that followed. I decided to go into the church and get a drink and cool down, escaping the large number of gnats that constantly accosted me whenever I stepped outside. The church itself was made out of white plaster, a common style in Florida. The exterior was peeling, but the inside seemed to have been cared for meticulously. The dark green carpet was everywhere except for the chapel, which itself was burgundy with gold designs. The building of the church was shaped like a T. You entered the double doors at the bottom of the T. The long hallway had an extended mirror, and this was attached to one wall and a sitting bench was on the other. There was wood, sort of a, well they're saying beadboard, but there was wood breadboard type paneling that went halfway up the wall to the mirror. As you continued down the hall at the T-junction, you could take a left and walk into the chapel, or you could go right and walk into the large dining area that was filled with tables. I walked through the doors at the bottom of the T, and as teenagers really won't do, I glanced at the mirror to check my own reflection, check the outfit, the hair, overall appearance. Adolescence is a vain time. Anyway, as I looked into the mirror, I saw Alvin sitting in the bench opposite the mirror, just looking at me. I quickly questioned what he was doing, and sighed away from everybody else. Hey Al, what are you doing, man? Don't like kick... And as I'm saying it, interrupting my sentence, he smiled in what felt like a disingenuous, menacing simper. He then raised his hand, formed a gun-shaped hand gesture, and winked while pointing at me clicking his tongue to make a sound. Acting in a way that seemed uncharacteristic for who I knew Alvin to be, I chuckled and turned away from the mirror to speak to him. As I did that, I realized there was no one there. I looked back at the mirror to confirm that I was alone in the hallway. I didn't understand. I didn't just see him out of the corner of my eye, I mean, at first I did, but then I looked right at him, into his eyes with the mirror simply as a conduit. I heard the sound of his tongue making what would soon be a familiar clicking sound. When the image of Al disappeared, the fright washed over me in what seemed to be a similar to a panic attack. A tingling that transformed my warm body into a shaky, nervous husk of who I usually was. I ran outside and grabbed the first person that I came in contact with, my friend Ronnie. Ronnie and I were not extremely close, but we had fun together because we were both outgoing, obnoxious, overconfident males that focused more on the fun than the purpose of our visit. When I approached him, I immediately saw in his eyes that he knew something was wrong. Dude, I don't know what's happening. I just saw something super weird. I feel like I'm losing my mind. What happened? Ronnie asked starting to smile with some humor at how freaked out I seemed. I don't, I just, I walked inside and looked in the mirror to see Al just sitting there, smiling at me. But it wasn't Al. It looked like him, but when I started talking to him, he just stared at me and made this gesture. At this point, I showed him the finger pointing and the winking gesture. Something about the way I recreated the look seemed to take the smile from Ronnie's face. When I started talking to him and I 
turned to continue the conversation, Al wasn't there. As if we were thinking the exact same thing, we turned to look out and find where Alvin was at that moment. Our eyes scanned the crowd in opposite directions, both arriving at the same point where Al sat, watching the kickball game. He was not partaking, as I remember him to be a pretty sober, pensive kid, not the kickball type, definitely not one who would have given me some weird pointing gesture while winking. Al was all the way over there, so what was it, a ghost, like a demon or something? Ronnie asked, shocked. Dude, how the crap should I know? We spoke in a very strange, surfer-like dialect for two mid-Michigan boys. I then saw this look of what seemed to be understanding wash over Ronnie's face. Like it all made sense to him. He said, You know what this is, right? This is Satan. He's trying to distract you from doing God's work. He has no power here. Let's go tell him. I followed Ronnie into the church like we were on some mission. It was empty again, but I felt this cold, uneasy feeling as soon as we stepped inside. As I said, it was the middle of summer in Florida. We were inside an old church with a barely functioning AC unit, but I remember instantly being chilled. Ronnie starts yelling, Hey, Satan, you ain't got nothing on us. Bring it. You can't stop us. What you got? Did I mention that we were overconfident? We waited in silence for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only 30 seconds. Nothing happened. We looked at each other, seeing what seemed to be a creeped out sort of factor showing up in each of our faces. We paused for a split second, then began laughing out loud at the ridiculousness of the situation. Maybe I just overreacted. Dramatic teenagers and whatnot. The evening ended after the last adult arrived to pick up their child. My young group that I loaded the bus and headed back to the condo that we were renting all came with. It was dark by this time and I had calmed down a bit, momentarily forgetting what had happened. The bus ride took some time, so I usually would just sit there, looking out the window at the landscapes that were usual, kind of unusual to me, the boy being from the north. We drove along the coast, passing interesting architecture surrounded by unfamiliar foliage, common to Florida ecosystems. As we rode, I looked out the window and saw a person sitting on a large stone sign for a different church, a Roman Catholic cathedral. I squinted to see him, as I was curious what that character was doing, sitting on such a fancy-looking stone slab sign. As the bus got closer and closer, my growing fright started to grow yet further, and I started to realize that that person sitting on the slab was someone I knew. The person was Alvin. He was sitting on the sign, looking down at his feet as he kicked them, resembling that of a much younger boy. As we passed, Alvin, quote unquote, sitting on the sign, he looked up from his feet and looked directly at me. His eyes were not Alvin's eyes, they were different. Another, older, wiser man's eyes. Piercing through the motion and distance, he looked at me and smirked with that menacing, threatening grin. As we began to pass, I turned my head to look to the front of the bus. Just a few seats ahead of me, Al sat, quietly doing what I had been doing a few moments before, looking at the water. I looked back out the window as we passed. The other, Alvin, raised his hand into a familiar gun-pointing gesture and pointed at me. What was even more strange, though, is I could hear the clicking sound in my head. And I'm not sure how to explain this, but it wasn't coming from me. It wasn't my common inner monologue voice. It was someone else. Something else. He winked. For lack of a better phrase... I began to freak out. I shouted and drew attention from some of my friends, my assistant youth pastor Jason and my pastor David. I remember thinking that I was losing my mind, the intensity of the faux Alvin eyes and the click of his tongue playing on repeat in my brain. No one seemed to understand my panic. David said we would talk once we got settled back at her condo. I guess I should just take a breath. We arrived at the condo. 
It was lavish accommodations to a small town kid, causing me to wonder how one would arrange payment for such a place, especially for a gaggle of teenagers. It had tall vaulted ceilings and the decor was designed in the early 90s, so it was fitted with brass lightning fixtures and lightly stained oak furnishings. Exiting the bus, my knees were shaky. Fog of embarrassment settled over me as other kids gazed with an obvious wonder that only children would lack the decorum would kind of show, right? My youth pastors took me into the back bedroom, away from the other kids. Gave me a pint of haagen ice cream. Good choice. That assisted in calming my nerves. Not surprised. Once settled, they proceeded to talk to me about what they thought was happening. David gave his version of what he believed was transpiring. There is a war happening. A war between heaven and hell, where angels and demons are in a battle for the souls and sanity of God's followers. And what you and Ronnie did was incredibly stupid. You challenged Satan to a battle that you cannot win. He is too powerful. That was his foothold. You need to be careful. This did very little to calm my nerves. It seemed uncharacteristically morose of David to be that blunt, especially with a teenager. And yet he continued, Do not do that again. If you keep doing the right thing, God will protect you. But you cannot tell anyone else that this happened. It spreads fear that Satan thrives on. Being a naive young Christian at the time, I believed him. I thought that this war could seem possible, but I also trusted a mentor that I shouldn't share my story, and I would follow that advice for years. I went to bed early that night, trying to move past this experience. Alvin's face and the clicking gesture continued to haunt my thoughts. It didn't work. The next day was our last at the church. We were done coordinating the VBS program, but the leaders of the church wanted to treat us to a dinner as a way of saying thanks. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was very strange that we hadn't met the pastor of the church until this dinner. Beforehand, we had packed up all of our belongings. We were prepared to leave once we finished dinner. We all sat on the east side of the church, in the dining area with all the tables eating the spaghetti dinner that they had provided us. It was a happy scene, I guess. I looked around at everybody enjoying the meal, laughing and joking around at the tables. Suddenly the back door of the church opened, and a cold gust of wind rushed past me. Bizarre for a Florida summer afternoon. And this was followed by the entrance of a tall elderly man and two slightly younger women behind him. As with all members of the youth group, I'd never met this man before. He was introduced to us as the pastor, but none of us recall ever hearing his name or f first or last. All I could focus on was his eyes. They seemed familiar to me, although I couldn't place them. They weren't kind eyes, although I couldn't articulate that in my mind at the time. He spoke a short sentence or two of thanks to the group, and then proceeded to move past the tables, sharing short statements of small talk, referring to my friends as guys and ladies, or in the case of Ronnie, who was sitting next to me, young man. He also slowly approached me. I continued to eat spaghetti, because free food. The pastor moved deliberately behind me until I could feel his bony hand touch my right shoulder. I turned around to look and saw the pastor glaring straight into my eyes. Not a polite stranger's glance, but a deep, disturbing glance. Those eyes. I had seen those before. He took his hand off my shoulder and spoke. Hey, how's it going? Something was wrong, and it was immediately obvious to me. No one had met this pastor, he didn't know any of us from Adam, and he referred to everybody as such, with generic titles like Son and Darlin. But he knew my name. He looked at me like he knew me, and then he did it. He smiled in that familiar, menacing way. 
lifted his hand and made the pointing gesture while winking. He closed it out with the tongue-clicking sound. I shot up, backed up quickly, clambered for my footing as I knocked over some empty chairs and ran out of the dining hall. I ran to the adjacent chapel and did the only thing that came to mind at the moment, sat in a pew and cried. My pastor and my pastor's wife, Kathy, followed me shortly after. I expected to hear their voice of reassurance. The kind people that had been mentors to me for years. That is not what followed. What are you doing? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen. What's wrong with you? You're acting like a baby, Kathy exclaimed. This was extremely uncharacteristic of both of them so I knew something was wrong. They were usually very calm, kind people in public. So I ran from them. I ran out of the chapel, down the long hallway, past the mayor where I'd originally saw who I thought was Alvin, and out the front doors. Followed directly after me, Kathy stepped out of the door before the door even closed. I turned to see her expression transform from angry hunter to concerned caregiver. What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? I knew immediately why the anger left her. She had left the church. She was outside. Something was wrong with that place. After discussing what I felt had happened, I never went that church again, waited outside for the rest of my group to finish eating. Afterwards, David, with a small group of us, did some weird type of ritual where we anointed the church and its door with oil. He read some scriptures that were unfamiliar to me, and we boarded the bus and left. Haven't spoken with David or Kathy in decades. But directly after this happened, Kathy, while coming short of saying I was lying, disagrees with the sequence of events. She seems to believe that she heard me making a ruckus outside, so she followed me directly out there, concerned for my well-being. David remembers being angry at me, and while he seems more docile out of the building, he seemed to treat me differently afterwards. The church itself seems to have been disbanded. I cannot find any mention of the church on the internet, and members of the youth group that I have kept in touch with have gone to Sarasota and not been able to find the same location. Even though we took the same route several times a day, one particular friend said that there's just a field where the building used to be, as if this experience had never even happened. Because David had told me that I shouldn't talk about what had happened, I didn't discuss this experience with any of my church friends, at least not for a long while after. A few years later, I spoke about these events with friends I made outside of the church, and my stories often met with a mixture of interest and skepticism and I often find myself in this weird experiencing this phenomenon on repeat in my head again. I've since left the church and personally have arrived at a certain level of being agnostic. I like to think that I don't believe in ghosts or demons, but I also cannot deny that which happened to me in the summer of 97. I do not have an explanation, and there are too many things that do not make sense. I hope that I just had a mental break of some sort, because the alternative is much more frightening. Looking for some input on household paranormal incidents. I live in a house with my mom, sister, stepdad, stepsister, two dogs, and my cat. My stepdad is a major paranormal skeptic. My sister is a little over-believing, and my mom and stepsister are mostly neutral. A lot of my family's been experiencing some really scary things. My grandpa's moved because of it, and it's sort of common knowledge that we can all tell if something is paranormal or not. My grandpa has had weird, terrifying things happen that he'll insist aren't paranormal at all, and some things that are slightly less scary that he'll insist were. 
I can generally tell if somebody else is telling the truth about some experience, but for myself, I just can't tell the way that they can. And I think it's partially because of my anxiety, which is constantly making my thoughts contradict themselves. Anyway, I have several seemingly disconnected incidents that I guess I can just bullet point out. They're over my entire span of living here, so I can't really remember the order. I'm standing in my sister's doorway. I was leaning on the door frame, reading over a thing that she wrote for school. She had wanted me to look it over, and the dog ran past me. Kind of shoving me a little, I said, That's rude, Mr. Sanders. The dog's name is Barry Sanders. We don't watch football, don't ask me. A couple seconds later, I hear my sister crying and look up. The dog is asleep in her lap and was there the entire time, so whatever ran past me was not our dog. We can't talk about it out loud because it still makes us choke up just how scared we were in that moment. I was laying in bed, it was pretty dark, but I wasn't asleep yet. I was just sitting on my phone waiting to get tired. I heard a really loud bang come from my closet, and my cat ran over and laid directly on my neck which she does when either one of us gets scared. I already had Snapchat open, so I decided to start recording to see if it happened again, because I was pretty sure that there were animals living in the walls. But my parents insisted that they weren't that big of a deal, so I was hoping something else would happen so I could have a bit of proof that I had reason to be bothered. You can't see anything in the video, though. There's only sound. At the time, that didn't phase me, because all I needed was proof the animal made sounds. Instead of another noise from the closet or the walls, there was a click, which you can barely make out in the video, but from my bed, I could see that it was the door handle turning. After that, the closet door swung back and forth, creaking extremely loudly when it normally hardly does at all. For the 11 seconds, if I remember correctly, that I kept recording, I stopped because I wanted to turn the light on and immediately went to show the video to my mom. It happened another time after that. At night again, but I didn't record. I didn't feel threatened, but I did start keeping my laundry basket in front of the closet door and haven't had it happen really since then. This one is possibly the scariest because no one's been able to explain it in a way that matches up with the story. Me and my sister were in the kitchen. Both parents were taking a nap and had been so for about an hour. We were the only ones in that kitchen for at least the previous hour. On the counter there were some dirty dishes and out of nowhere my mom's measuring cup just explodes into tiny pieces all over the kitchen. We couldn't even walk anywhere. We had to yell for our parents to put on shoes and sweep the floor around us that way we could go and shake the glass out of our hair and clothes. I've looked it up and found some things about Pyrex measuring cups exploding, but not to the extent ours did, and ours was not a Pyrex. It was a really old one with all the measuring letters engraved, so they wouldn't wash off. My grandma had given it to my mom about three or four years earlier. I was looking at different measuring cups for the sake of this post, and it was the same general look as the bread bunny, but I don't believe ours was. Once I was on the phone with a friend, and two things on my wall, one hung canvas and one hung glass frame, both fell at the exact same time. That's probably the one that can be explained the most easily, I guess, and it's also the shortest, but it's still weird. Similar to the dog incident, we, my stepsister and I, once opened the front door to get ready to go to school, and something large and black, a little bigger than our lab, looked like it ran through the house. However, we knew it wasn't the dog because he was already inside, and again, this was bigger than him. I don't think it was the same situation as the dog incident, though, because it didn't sort of push us at all and didn't really have a specific shape, whereas the previous one was so much like our dog that he had been in another room when it happened, we would have thought about it again. Or we wouldn't have even thought about it again, we would have assumed it was him. 
But this was just sort of a black blob that appeared solid but wasn't. And by the time we turned around, it was gone. There's some other smaller things, like canned goods falling over when they shouldn't be able to do that by themselves. The shower curtain being open, it was almost definitely closed before. Things going missing and showing up in odd places. My family also has quite a bit of paranormal and non-paranormal disturbing backstory if anybody might be interested in more context. Specifically, some things that happened when I was in my early teens. Some things my grandpa said, who my stepdad bought the property from, and my family's very weird trademark of having near-death experiences and dying young, and how death follows us around in general. I really don't know if I'm looking to be proven wrong or told that I can't be. I guess it would be nice to get some other opinions. I've also neglected to include the door video, because as I said, it's really only audio, and I believe that was the first paranormal aligned incident that I actually paid attention to. And it was over two years ago now. If anybody really thinks it'll help, I'll try to find it, but I honestly don't think it'll provide much since it's just the sound of a door creaking, and that could be faked pretty easily. Like I said, I'm willing to provide whatever background info you guys might want for anybody looking to give me some input, advice, explanations, or whatever else. I got Reddit specifically to post this somewhere because all my other social media accounts are semi-professional to mostly professional. And while this isn't a throwaway, I definitely don't want to look like an idiot on my regular public profiles. I met my daughter from the future. I'm a 21-year-old with no kids. It's important to know for the story. So I went with my dog for a walk this morning, and I was about to cross the street when I noticed a girl about my age staring at me from the other street parallel to the one I was on. I first didn't think a lot about it, and I just kept going. Then I saw how she crossed the street to come to the one that I was walking on while still staring at me. We crossed ways... And when we got closer, I could see her expression, and it was something like pity and nostalgia. It felt like she somehow knew me from somewhere. Well, we crossed paths, but of course I didn't stop and stare at her back, so I kept going. Then I turned to look at her once more, and she was still standing on the same spot I walked past her five seconds ago. And she was looking straight in my face with the same expression of pity. I continued walking, and after a few seconds I turned again, and she was still there, staring at me with that exact same expression as last time I turned back to look at her before I continued my walk. I don't know why or how, but a thought just came directly into my mind, without any previous context. In my head I was convinced that's, that I guess this girl was my daughter from the future. And she was looking at me that way because I died, and she was missing me. The whole day I'm still really freaked out by this experience, and I thought about it. Look at my dad died when I was seven, and the night of his death, my mom dreamed that he came to her in a dream, talked to her, and said that he was okay, and that she doesn't want to be worried about him. What if in my daughter's timeline, I died, and this moment was me in her dream? seeing her for the last time like my father saw my mother for the last time in her dream. My father seemed to recognize my mother in the dream, and somehow I had that instant thought without previous context that that girl was my daughter. I recognized her instantly. I get shivers down my spine when I'm writing this. Like I said, I never had to do with such things. I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in God. I've never believed in ghosts, but I have no explanation for this. Maybe I'm just crazy. A recurring dream that I can't explain is anything other than paranormal. So we moved into an old farm a few years ago. I did lots of renovation work found lots of strange things. 
boarded up rooms, bricked up entrance to a cellar, loads of old abandoned items left there too. The thing that's really bothering me is in our main kitchen, there's a small ladder there. When we renovated, we wired some electrics and plumbing into there. Oh, excuse me. There's a small larder there. When we renovated, we wired some electrics and plumbing into there, and the room is used to store fridge, foods, washing machine, things like that. However, shortly after we started using that room, I began having a recurring nightmare. During the nightmare, I'm stuck in a wall cavity. I can hear moaning, screaming, crying, scratching sounds. I scream for help, but nobody or nothing is there to hear me. I'll usually wake quite agitated and worked up from this nightmare. I've never had this nightmare before we moved into this house. After the first couple of times, I noticed a small pattern. I only had that dream when the door to the larder was left open. I dismissed it at first, but after a couple more occurrences, I started making sure it was shut before I went to bed. The nightmare stopped. Now, I've always been a bit skeptical, you could say, and I would dismiss it as maybe a subconscious thing, knowing it was shut enough to stop the dreams. However, shortly after I had the nightmare again that night, I got up to check the door was open. I closed it, bolted it, and went back to bed. I asked my fiancé about it, and he had got up in the night to go get a drink, and he left the door open. I told him about it, and he was also a bit skeptical, but thought it was odd. Regardless, he agreed to make sure it was shut in the future, too, to make me feel better. We've been really strict about this, and the doors remained closed every night since just under a year. Two days ago, my aunt had to borrow the washer machine. She lives on the farm with us, but in a separate building. As hers had broken down, apparently. She forgot about her washing and just popped it in to get after I had already gone to bed. She left the door open, and I had the nightmare again. I can say with 100% certainty I only have that dream when I'm in this house and that door is open, even when I'm not aware of it being open. Struggling to find a non-paranormal explanation for this, is my kitchen, or rather the larder haunted? I saw a post earlier about alien abductions, and it sounds very similar to what I went through as a kid. When I lived in the apartments, at a young age, I would always have nightmares. This is normal for all kids, of course, for them to be so afraid that they cover their heads in bed. Unless the mass population, I would have these strange feelings and I'll be compelled to run outside as far as I could from the house. Obviously, there was maybe only things like this happening ten years ago, so my memory of why I did this is still foggy. There was a time I ran to my friend's apartment building, some blocks away, and I banged on the door and his dad answered. I remember telling him somebody was out to get me. He then simply tells me to go home. So I do. As if the trance broke and I went home still slightly shaken, but I was perfectly fine and slept well. So this happened so frequently, I remembered my dad locking my bedroom door from the outside with rope so I wouldn't run away again. There was a time he caught me sleepwalking around the house at 11 p.m., but the rope didn't really help much. On one particular night, I had this insane feeling of fear and desire to get out of my room. I was so much in fear that I forcibly opened the door to my room, the rope snapped, and I ran outside. Everything after this went fuzzy, and I then remembered it being around 6 or 7 a.m., and I was a couple blocks away from my apartment home. I remember just walking around, and I was legit wondering why I was walking this far away, and how did I stay up the whole night? I walked back home and just in time to see my mom at the door. She thought I came out to help her with groceries, so I never really told her the truth. Not long after that, the nightmare stopped. I ended up moving farther south to Jersey. But the sleepwalking and the sleep-talking never stopped. 
till this day. Meeting the entity on the roof. This happened to me about four or five years ago while I was living in a major metropolitan area of the Pacific Northwest. My wife and I lived in a condo on the second floor of this oldish two-story building. While my wife was back home in Texas for a long weekend, weird shit started happening in our home. On the first night I was alone, I started hearing footsteps on the roof. Mind you, these sounded like stomps and not like little feet, just in case you thought it might have been a raccoon, possum, or some other night creature. They were loud, as if someone was running in circles right above my bed. Really freaked me out, but I tried to ignore it. Following night, my sister and mom stayed the night because they were visiting from a few towns over. That night, I let my mom and sister sleep in the room as I slept on the couch. My sister and my mom heard the stomps, too. They didn't know what to make of it, so they woke me up to go check the roof. I went outside and looked, but there was nothing to be seen. They left the next day, and we still didn't have a clue what the fuck was going on. It was getting really freaky by this point, so... The night they left, I slept by myself in the condo again. I laid there without being able to sleep, and by 2 or 3 a.m. the stomping began. It would run all across the roof, and when it would get to the room, it would start stomping hard. So I'm really freaked out at this point, and I decided to load my handgun just in case it's some crazy homeless person, or someone being crazy on the roof at 3 a.m., it kept running on the roof as I loaded the gun when all of a sudden the stomping stops. And then I hear a loud thump by the door, as if someone had jumped from the roof to the front of my door. It knocked on my door three times, loud as fuck. At this point I'm paralyzed in fear, but I said, fuck it, whatever it is, it's going to get a bullet straight to the head. I walked carefully towards the door, opened the door as fast as I could, but no one was there. I checked the roof under the stairs and there was no sign of anyone. The fear I felt made me run cold through all my body because I still felt its presence, but I just couldn't see anyone. I went back inside, locked the door and laid in bed with the gun next to me. I was terrified and couldn't sleep all night. The next night my wife comes home. I told her everything had been going on and she just couldn't believe it. She asks me how come I only heard it when she was gone and never happened in the past when she was here. I told her I didn't know why it happened and why it happened that weekend when she wasn't around, but it did happen. I had witnesses, my sister and mom. They also heard the stomping. So I'm not going crazy and this isn't just my imagination. I'm perfectly healthy, mentally and physically. So this couldn't have been some weird mental disorder. We go to bed together that night. She tells me not to really worry and that I probably had smoked a little too much weed during the weekend. I'm a bit pissed at her because she doesn't believe me and thinks I'm being superstitious. As we're falling asleep, something pulls on my toe. A hard pull on my toe, not some light touch. It was a violent pull on my big ass toe. I get up and wake up my wife and tell her. By this point, she thinks I'm having some sort of hallucination that I should probably not smoke weed at all anymore. And even, I kind of started believing I was losing my mind. But as we're getting comfortable to go back to sleep, the entity violently pulls her toe as well. She gets out of the bed in complete disbelief and trembling in fear. We turn the lights on, check to see if someone was under the bed. But there is absolutely nothing and no one. We couldn't get back to sleep that night, and a few days later the nail on my big ass toe turned a light shade of purple. The fuck happened? I have no fucking idea, and to this day I have no fucking clue. Okay guys, this title I can't even read it, but I'm gonna read it verbatim, just in case anyone's still awake and wants to chuckle. And no disrespect, by the way. 
You might just be writing this scared. I'm if this a story sub, but this happened. Am deny don't know how live anymore. That was good. Okay. I live in eastern Washington state, and all my life I've always wanted to experience some things unnatural. This night I had just finished playing Among Us with some friends on Discord. I went out to my living room for, I guess, my kitchen. They're both connected and I grabbed a glass of water. I looked at the orchard and we have a small chicken coop in that orchard. And underneath one of the apple trees to the right of the chicken coop for the small chicks I saw a pile of sticks. I've never seen these piles before. I thought that was weird. I looked at it jokingly. I was like, oh, it's like a gnome or something, since I'd recently heard a story about them. Then I felt this feeling of being watched. Yes, Gecko. So I went around the cupboard and I peeked at it, and I got this disgusting feeling of dread I've never felt. I've never felt so small and weak before in my life. I never, I never thought I'd feel something so wrong. I felt hunted. I felt like an animal. I started heading towards my room, and I looked back, and it felt wrong, so wrong, so wrong, I can't get over the feeling of horror that I felt when I looked back at the window. I messaged a friend on Messenger about it, and then it started happening. A bump on my window, and he told me to record it. I recorded it and it happened again, and I know that there's no difference, no trees by my window. The closest tree is a pear tree, about four yards away from my window. Cut that bloody thing every year because cutting the grass around that fucking thing is miserable. I know that the pear tree didn't touch my window bit, but it assured me that maybe that dreadful feeling was there and it left a small and I tried to ignore it. Confusing. I tried to watch something. I need to fight the feeling of fear. I even tried to ask for help at my parents' rooms on the way by that window. And when I peeked it, it felt wrong. I ran back, and that's when I heard it. I heard this beating, this beating. It was like a heartbeat. I couldn't tell where it came from. I think it was on my roof. I got scared, and no, I hid underneath my covers. I hid underneath my covers like a little bitch. I hid. I was scared. I've never been so scared in my life. The closet, this feeling that I was being assaulted by a bunch of dogs. A bunch of dogs when I lived in Peru. And that's when I started hearing it, this moaning, this horrid moaning. And I, I, I asked my friend what to do, and he told me to record, and I did. I recorded it. I recorded it, and I sent it to him. By the way, guys, there's no periods or anything. I'm just raw dogging this. I sent it to him, and I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a man or an animal. What was it? I, 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 I sent him two videos, but then I felt the cover move up by my leg, and I felt it grab me. It picked me up with one arm, or I don't know what its appendage or some fucking thing. It was a mess if you could grab hold of me with that entire arm in a small room, and I saw its face illuminated by an aquarium light. It was vibrating. I don't know what it was. I don't know what that thing was. I just can't describe its face. It's just I can't. I just can't. I just can't. My body shakes and goes numb when I think about it. I know it has a mouth that laid me on the ground by the side of my bed, and it put his big arm overneath my chest and put his mouth next to my face, and it said it, said it in perfect English. It said it the most perfect English I could ever heard, and it was as if a dog decided to speak. It sounded wrong, but it was so fucking perfect. And it told me, it told me, don't peek. And as abruptly as it came, it left. I don't know how it got in my room. I feel so unsafe, oh my god. How did it get into my room? How? I don't know. All my life I wanted to feel high. Wanted to see something unnatural. Something supernatural. I've never, I've never been religious. But, I would, I said this night fucked me. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. It's a face. It left me intact and, no, it wasn't sleep. It moved me. It moved me from one p -p -p -s to another. And I sat there shaking and I fucking pissed myself. I don't know what to do. I've never been so afraid in my life. My friend told me to ask on forums for what this was and I'm starting here. Please, if anyone knows what this thing was with this thing, please tell me if you're into cryptid or monsters, ghosts or anything of that or aliens. 
It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not fucking worth it. It's not worth it. <clears throat> Editor. No more stories like that. That is, um, well, I hope somebody got a chuckle out of it. With all due respect. Moving on. Strange encounter during a time of grief. So this happened to my family a few years back, but I believe it's a rather interesting unexplained phenomenon, and I just discovered the sub. A little background before I get started. Me and my mom and my uncle all reside in Texas. Grandmother, uncle too, and cousins too reside in New Mexico, where my grandmother is a shop. Cousin One is off at college in Colorado. Uncle One decides to go visit Cousin One at school, but on his way stops in New Mexico to see the family for a few days. While visiting, a strange woman stops in the shop and asks for directions. She and Uncle One get to chatting, and I'm not sure of the specifics that lead to this conversation, but she proceeds to tell him about a dream that she had recently. She says that in her dream she was driving through the mountains and suddenly came to a halt. She realizes that there is a mountain lion lying dead in the middle of the road. She gets out to see if there's anything she can do, but when she approaches the mountain lion, it takes life again and runs away into the mountains. The conversation comes to an end and the woman takes her directions and goes about her way. Uncle One brushes the whole thing off as odd but doesn't really give it much more thought. Days later, Uncle One convinces Uncle Two to accompany him to Colorado to visit Cousin One. There's a lot of numbers here. It's important to note here that Uncle Two has emphysema. Where they were visiting was a much higher altitude, and Uncle Two ended up getting severe altitude sickness. It became so bad that he ended up in the hospital in an induced coma. Me, my mom, aunt, grandma, and cousins, too, all travel to Colorado to be there with him. Days turn into weeks, turn into months, and he's not getting better, let alone coming out of his coma. One day we're all tired and stressed as things are looking grim. We're trying to decide where to eat when one of cousin, two asks for Applebee's. No one else wants to eat there. We try to talk her into something local, not a chain. She's insistent, and since Uncle Two is her father, the family takes pity in caves. This is where things get weird. As we're sitting at our table, the same odd woman from the whole other state from months before appears standing beside our table. She looks Uncle One dead in the eyes and says, It's time to go. And in the blink of an eye, she's gone with nowhere to be found. Moments later, the hospital calls and says it's time to take Uncle Two off the life support. We abandon our meals, head to the hospital, and they do just that. Uncle One never sees the strange woman again. Stuck in Deja Vu This happened nearly ten years ago, but I, a 32-year-old female, can't shake the experience. So I have had deja vu a thousand times, like many people, but it always seems to be gone in the blink of an eye. However, when I was in my early twenties, I had an entirely different experience. I was hanging out with a couple of friends, Dane and Corey, at Dane's house. Now I've had multiple strange experiences there, mostly paranormal. Dane has lost two fathers. And he believes, as I do, that his biological father has stuck around. But that's neither here nor there. So me, Dane, and Corey are all hanging out in this shed in the backyard where we normally do. We're just sitting there chatting when all of a sudden I got struck by a serious case of deja vu. Instead of it ending in an instant, it seemed like it was never going to stop. My heart started racing and the guy just could see that there was something wrong. I told them what was happening, 
and the only way I could describe it was that it felt like a film strip stuck on repeat in my head was playing, like when a CD skips. I started to panic as the minutes passed. I felt disoriented, but I knew I needed to get out of that shed. It had been about five minutes since it started, which may not seem very long, but it felt very long. I tried to gain my bearings and stood up, though I quickly tumbled back into the chair. I tried again and stumbled out of the shed. Dane's backyard has a big, beautiful oak tree right outside the shed. As I stepped outside and my feet hit the earth's surface, I felt a calm come over me. A breeze came out of nowhere and the branches of the tree started moving rhythmically. It's hard to explain, but I felt planted, just like the tree, like I couldn't move. I felt an odd connection with the universe, like some force was trying to connect with me, as if an invisible laser beam came from the sky straight to my mind. This frightened me even more, though. The guys came out to check on me and snapped me out of it, broke down in tears. We decided to go back to the house and I told them what happened. Corey was freaked out and left. I kept telling Dane about the film strip. I felt scared and out of it, not like myself. I really thought I was going to have to check myself into a mental institute, so I decided to go home. Once I got home, I calmed down, but I still felt uneasy for the rest of the night. I was too scared to sleep. I had this giant book of different phenomenons and unexplained mysteries of the world that I've glanced through a few times. I looked up deja vu and sure enough, right there on the page my exact words were printed. It said that sometimes deja vu can be long and frightening and be described as a film strip stuck on repeat. That's the end of the story tonight, guys. I'm sorry, I'm still having nom flashbacks from two stories back of endless run-on sentences. And again, no disrespect, it was just, I haven't had any coffee and my gecko is going insane. So, as usual, sleep tight. See ya. Step Beyond the Ordinary with Paranormal M. Subscribe and enable notifications to delve into stories that challenge conventional understanding. Get ready to be amazed by our latest mind-bending narratives. Being watched over by the unknown. About five or seven-ish months again, I decided to hang out with my ex-wife to see how things were going. A foolish mistake that I chose to partake in. I meet up with her at night time, and I drove, just drove around town. I had a feeling that I shouldn't be around her due to obvious reasons as to why I divorced her in the first place, but my human mentality of maintaining a relationship took over. There were three warnings, I guess you could say, that happened throughout the night. I'd like your thoughts and interpretation and explanation on this strange night. I had gotten pulled over because my headlights weren't on. I haven't gotten pulled over in about three years since this experience. The officer, being a kind man, as well informed me that my taillights weren't on. I gave him a surprised expression and said, Huh, that's weird because from my switch here it's telling me that they should be on. He raised his eyebrow, walked to the back of my car, came back and said, Surprisingly, they're on now. I didn't touch my car light switch at all. They were supposedly on the entire time from when I started my car like 30 minutes prior to this. The officer apologized for the misunderstanding and bid me a good night. Nice guy. Two. We were driving around in the country back roads. Ended up in a small town. I wanted to park and chill because the cop experience weirded me out a little bit. I pulled into the parking lot of a much older church and drove all the way in the back so that no other cop would pull up and question me. I park in the back and turned my car off. Me and her start conversing, and about 20 minutes into the conversation we both noticed that the street lamp in front of us was flickering at an odd pattern. The lamp would flicker violently for a couple seconds and fade in and out of brightness before being shut off. We look at each other confused, 
The lamp next to the one had been shut off, repeated in the same pattern, but backwards. It faded in and out of brightness, flickered violently, and then shut off. A sense of dread and doom filled the atmosphere around us. I turned my car on and slowly drove out of the parking lot. When I turned onto the main road and began to drive away, I glanced over to my rearview mirror and saw that the same two lamp posts turned back on simultaneously. Three. Coming from the old church, we drove back to the city that I'd gotten pulled over in. I parked in front of a closed coastal Mexican food restaurant. We started talking, and the atmosphere in the vehicle got hot and heavy. She wanted to make out and made the first move. Me being me, I didn't decline this offer. We started to make out. I told her to get in the back. She did, and I followed. As things were on the verge of getting far from just a simple make-out session, as clear as day, we both heard a loud, intense, and heavy growl from what seemed like a beast coming from the rear passenger side of my car. The growl vibrated the vehicle from what felt like, and we stopped, sharing an expression of fear towards one another. I hear a disembodied voice say, Tell her to leave. I get out and investigate around the car. Me and her are the only living things out here. I tell her that we need to leave and the night's over. I drive her back to her car and we go our separate ways. I later found out that my ex-wife had been using black magic on me for years and had been paying witches to manipulate my emotions and beliefs. This was as a result to continue staying with her and seeing her when I shouldn't be. My personal belief is that my guardian angel or whatever being it was was trying to warn me and alert me to not see this woman again. Lucky guy. Me being stubborn as hell or having my judgment clouded by dark forces didn't really work until it became obvious. A whole ass different level of craziness. So what are your thoughts? Tell me of your first most prominent ghost encounter. Mine was when I was 16 years old, March 18th. I'm 44 now. I was asleep in my bed in the dark. Suddenly I woke up because someone called me. Immediately I recognized my grandmother. I couldn't see anything in the darkness, but I knew it was her. She said she loved me, and she had died. She had to leave. Suddenly, I started crying. I got up, stumbled around until I reached the door and opened it. It was daybreak, with a very faint glow in the lighting in the hallway that door opened to. I saw down on the pavement of the hallway, crying for what felt like forever. In truth, it was less than 20 minutes. The phone started to ring. My sister got up, walked by me, looked at me and asked, Why the heck are you crying? Then ignored me and went to answer the phone. What I heard was, I'll go call her now. My sister enters my parents' bedroom, which is right in front of me in the hallway, and my mom comes out. She looks at me with surprise, doesn't say a word, and goes to the telephone, which is ahead in the entryway at the end of the hallway. And then I hear, when and how it happened. At this point, everybody is up and about. Everyone saw me sitting there crying on the floor. I heard mom saying that her mom, my grandma, died 20 minutes prior, and her aunt had just called to give the news. At this point, everybody knows that I knew she passed before the phone call, but nobody says a thing. Everyone swipes it under the rug, acting as if nothing happened with me. Crying for hours, no one will believe me when I even say it, even though they all witnessed it as it happened. Do you see shadow people with your physical eyes? I can see a couple types of shadow people with my own eyes. The first time happened when I was with a friend. She's also a sensitive. It was a late evening, 
and we were on a street which is usually busy, but at that time of the day, it's fully emptied. She was driving. I was on the seat next to her, and another friend was in the back. Suddenly I see this shadow zap super fast in front of us crossing the road. It was shaped as a human but completely black, not see-through. We all were laughing and chatting, making loud jokes, and suddenly I shut up. She shuts up and stops the car right then and there. We both look left and right, then we realize we both saw that. We look at each other and simultaneously said, Did you see that? The person in the black, which also was looking forward as we did, saw nothing. I'm assuming they meant person in the back. The same spot sometime again later. I was walking back home and I saw it again but this time was standing next to a street light. My friend and I did some digging and found out some months prior a boy died on the intersection on a motorcycle accident, which still made waves because of some controversies. Earthbound spirit? We wondered. Fast forward a few years and I met a few times a different kind of shadow people. I'm not sure what it is, but I call them leeches. Why? Every time I've seen them, they were hovering behind next to a living person, like attached to them. I thought I was losing it, but this event that happened once at a friend's house made me rethink it. She was a woman with a lot, and I mean a lot, of unresolved anger. The type that are hyenas to everybody but her friends. We were at her house, a total of four people, three female, one male. We had dinner. We were sitting in the kitchen having drinks and snacks. We were telling funny stories and we were laughing loudly. You know, those situations where you laugh so much that your tears kind of form in your eyes? Well, I'm there, talking with my girlfriend, and I mentioned that she's sitting at the head of the table, alone. And I see this perfectly formed human-shaped shadow, fully black, dark and perfectly defined. The thing is bent on her right shoulder, looking forward, listening and I felt this sudden ice in my veins. I had a sudden fit of nausea and my guts felt like they twisted in my belly. I kept looking in a state of shock and the thing, when it realized I could see it, jumped back. I could feel its surprise that I could even see it and in a fast, sudden instant whoosh, it disappeared. Ran right away so fast I saw this black whooshing blob just for that instant. I was telling a joke, but suddenly I shut up. Imagine the scene. Three people that were loudly laughing suddenly and simultaneously are looking at me with a terror-stricken face, all asking, what? What did you see? They said my face turned gray. They saw the blood wash down it. I was petrified. Each one of them was directly looking at me since I was the only one speaking when this happened. I explained to them what I saw. The friend went silent, and she said that an uncle of hers saw something similar not long prior. But she was laying on the couch, and her uncle saw a dark shadow just hovering over her. Once I calmed down, I realized three things. The shadow felt as if it was feeding off my friend's energy, hence why I call them leeches. And my friend's extremely negative attitude was fueled by this shadow thing. The shadow was scared that I could see it, and was surprised ran for its life away from me. Have you ever been able to jump realities while lucid dreaming? In 2006-2007, I made a huge change in my life. One of those things those pivotal decisions that create a shift in reality. I lived in Italy where I was born. I dumped my boyfriend of eight years. I met my now husband, which I married a year later. I moved to the U.S. I had two kids, and while living my whole life until then, 31 years, with the certainty I didn't want kids ever. Around 2015 and 16, I had the most crazy lucid dream I'd ever had in my life. At that point in this reality, I had two little kids. I was overweight, still dealing with a losing baby fat thing, and 
I had copper-brown hair, about the top of my shoulder length, changed my fashion from black widow to hippie, happy-go-lucky spiritualist chick. In the dream, I was in this house, which I couldn't recognize. Literally, in the dream, I told myself, the hell am I? I looked around, and there were a bunch of people partying, eating snacks, smoking pot, drinking beer and wine. I recognized the infamous ex and a friend of ours with his girlfriend, not the others. I kept looking around, and I found a large mirror hanging on a wall. I went to it, and I saw my own reflection on it. Yup, this was me, but as skinny as I was when I broke up with them pre-children. Long, dark black blue hair. My old black wing eye makeup and dark cherry lips, dressed in black. I was not seeing the dream with my own eyes, but I was there. I felt trapped inside my body, which wasn't my body. Somewhere with people I knew, but not really. And I thought, this is not my life. I have two kids and I'm married. I realized in the dream that I went somewhere else. And this wasn't a dream, really. This place was real. It existed somewhere. Those people, those laughs, I could hear them loud. The clinking of the glasses was very real. The sunlight on my skin felt warm. The bright room was blinding my eyes. Mind me, all this was happening while I was sleeping. This was the first and last time I ever saw myself in a dream, in the reflection of a mirror. Through my own eyes, usually I either see but don't have a body or it's like I'm watching a movie of myself as a spectator of my own body interacting with the dream. What I see and me lucid dreaming are two different entities. In this dream, it was me. I was inside that version of me. I woke up from it feeling incredibly uneasy. I run to check on my kids to make sure that they were there. When I realized I was back to my reality, I had this huge sense of relief because the other alternate reality I saw was ugly. I felt how the me felt and it wasn't pretty at all. I'm convinced I did astral projection of some sort and I entered an alternate reality seeing how things would have been if I didn't leave my Italian ex. The Shadows My son is nine years old, and he's always been sensitive to energies and spirits. He's able to see how energy changes color, too. This past year, we're struggling with these shadows, and when I ask him to describe them to me, he said that they're small. They move incredibly fast in every direction. They do not interact with them. He stated that, it's like they can see me, but I can see them. They can't see me, actually. They feel frustrated. Now, I myself have about all the clues, more or less, some stronger than others. I have like a 100% accurate radar for creepy, dangerous, or annoying energy. Whatever it is, simply pissed off a spirit or something way lower on the scale. I can't sense those shadows. I don't feel my radar going crazy, at least, but my son is really scared of them. He says there's so many. For the past few months, we have a long ritual before bedtime. First, I set a UV lamp in his room. The UV light doesn't allow for... Excuse me. Let me paraphrase. UV lights don't allow a safe energetic vibration for ghosts to manifest. We do the energy bubble, quote-unquote. It's a grounding and protection exercise I do, where I breathe in and out and dipping into the universe life force. I call in the flow from the source, and I let it pass through my body, and I create a shield all around the house. Fun fact. I change often the energy I call in, whatever's needed, really. Healing is green. Protection, blue. Comfort, purple. My son, nine times out of ten, tells me the right color I produced. Second step, 
is the sigil of protection that we make on his third eye using an oil made with Solomon's seal root, which quote-unquote seals off all evil. The same sigil I reproduced in a magnet I handmade and he stuck right above his head. He had a bunk bed. Third, I got him a St. Benedict medal, which he rubs every night before going to sleep. Patron protector against evil, used in Catholic exorcism too. Sometimes the shadows are so prominent that all this is not enough and I have to use my own energy to blast them. This is a last resource though, because it's depleting for me. After I use my own energy, he says, a lot of orbs appear in place of the shadows. Have any of you ever seen or heard of the shadows as he's describing them? Note. I'm able to not only feel, but also see with my own eyes the shadow people. This house is shielded in ways you cannot even phantom. I'm guessing they mean fathom. I'm a holistic healer, a crystal healer, a Reiki healer, an earth witch, and I dabble in... or, and I dab in pranic healing. Never heard that term. Pranic, I believe. Prana, pranic, okay. I never before heard of the shadows that he mentioned. Be warned that I never taught my son any of all of this. Just recently I taught him the breathing exercises to calm his anxiety with the strange stuff happening to him. And of course the ritual we do nightly and why. But I keep both my kids well separated from my spiritual activities. My most prominent theory? Dimensions since he also sees orbs which are manifestations of spirits of different nature my best guess is that these shadows might be either remnants of a lower dimension or visible through the veil of presences from another reality but my guess is as right as any of yours could be huh excuse the writing on that one i'm reading it as is best i can moving on Missing cattle and the strangest experience of my life. My husband and I live on a farm of about 100 acres and raise cattle. It's a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day that he died. I'm familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. A few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you're unfamiliar with cattle, it's pretty strange for a cow to leave her calf, depending on the cow, of course. Our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there are quite a few hollers. We figured that the cow went down into a holler, died in the brush somewhere, or got into a neighbor's field. My husband looked and looked, but never found her, never found a body, never found any evidence of that cow. The day she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field where it was laid down like something had smushed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was a weird, spooky coincidence. Kind of funny. Ooh, supernatural. Until today. Today, my favorite cow went missing. My husband, sister, and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow. We combed every inch of fields. We searched the hollers. We checked the neighbor's fields. No sign of her. She also had a calf and was a notoriously good mama, and the calf is still here. I figured she got out into the neighboring cornfield, or perhaps somebody stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was also the only missing cow until I experienced the strangest thing that makes me think maybe it is supernatural. My sister and I were out looking for the missing cow around 6.37 p.m. and between two of our fields, there's a piece of land that we don't own that juts in between two of the fields that we do own. It's mostly wooded and bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cow sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search there. My sister and I are both in our late 20s and grew up running wild in the woods. 
We hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled tricks off ourselves. Nothing scared us then, and nothing scares us now. I crossed over the barbed wire to go look for the cow, and my sister stopped. Which is weird, she's my younger sister and always follows me. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken and telling her that I'd be there before that and that I wouldn't take her anywhere dangerous, and that she knows that. She kept stalling, and I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire, but kept stopping. Finally, she caught up with me, but as I walked further into the woods, I got a bad feeling. The only way I can describe it is dark. My sister also kept saying that she couldn't hear me, even though I was talking loudly and was only two feet away from her at the most. I finally stopped turned around, and we booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, the bad feeling went away. My sister went home a couple hours later because she was unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if what she thought about the woods was feeling off. She says that she was terrified the entire time. I'm going to quote her text beneath, or beneath here. It was like we were going down a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore, but it didn't feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me cry thinking about it, so I just told myself I was psyching myself out. It was right when we passed the fence, like we were somewhere we shouldn't have been. I was actually scared. I trust you and everything, of course, but the feeling I got standing and looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. The farther we went, it just got worse. Like a, like a dark shadow or something screaming at my insides, telling me to go back. Afterwards, I got a heavy feeling making me so tired. And this all happened this evening. We never found the cow or any sign of her. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I feel dread when I think about it. I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy. I wanted to recount the story somewhere so I wouldn't forget the details and to see if anybody had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening, supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you I've never felt anything like that in my entire life. My sister's never scared, which scared me even more. My Daughter's Gifts I always knew that my little Leah was different. She always knew how people felt and what they were trying to say without them saying anything. She's been in touch with the energy of everything around her for so long that after a while I just grew used to it. But then one day her father passed away. She was only four at that time and she was sleeping when I got the news, so I didn't tell her anything. I didn't even say anything until the week was done so that my oldest had a weekend to think before going back to school. So for days, I didn't say a thing. Even then, all my girls that were too small to understand death, I just said he'd gotten into an accident. The day of his funeral, my daughter gave me a drawing to give her father since she knew I was going to see him tomorrow. He said, of course, I'll be back after seeing Papa. We're a bilingual family, and she and I know. Then she says how much pain he was in. I was shocked and asked what she meant. She completely described all the damage his body got. He died in a skidoo accident. She said how his tibia broke, his back broke, he smashed his head, his glasses exploded in his face, his lips were bleeding, and he was coughing up blood. There could be more, but that's what I remember. I was shocked and I said, I don't think it was that bad. Months later, I got the coroner's report, and she was dead on. Every little detail she got, I started to cry. Did my daughter see what happened? Did her father visit her? How could this four-year-old know so much? Was someone in her body? Still to this day, the story gives me the creeps, and I'll never forget the day that she was able to say everything with a smile on her face. I think my deceased father is still here. My dad was a great dude. He was the heart and soul of our family. 
He was diagnosed with cancer in 2009 and passed away a few days before Christmas of 2018. He rarely missed a day of work throughout the many surgeries, chemo, and radiation. Anyway, I've struggled with addiction my entire life. Started with pills and such and ended up full-blown IV heroin cocaine addict. My dad never gave up on me and was hell-bent on straightening me up. A few months prior to his death, I went off the deep end again and lost my job and got myself in a bad way. When I came home and saw the shape he was in, it broke my heart because I knew he wasn't going to be here much longer. I immediately checked myself into detox, Halloween 2018. I've been sober since. Now on to my story. My mom and I are living in the house that he actually passed away in. For the first year or more, nothing happened. But the last year or so, there's been some really strange occurrences. And these occurrences, anybody who knew my dad would attribute to him. At first, it was just the televisions cutting off and on, stuff that can be easily written off. My mom and I even started jokingly saying, cut it out, Dad, every time something happened. Then it was his alarm clock which made us really give it a second thought, due to the fact that he was the most organized and punctual man you'd ever meet. He was an hour early to everything. Also, the blinds in our back door open every morning, even though we keep them closed, or else our other dog will stay there looking in and whimper all night. Every day I tell my mom to quit opening the blinds and shut them, and every morning they're open again. My dad used to do the same. When my sister and I were in high school, my dad would come into our rooms every morning on weekends and open our blinds to make us get up. Finally, once we started to acknowledge the things happening, a timer that my dad used to teach my niece how long to brush her teeth every night when she was a child, she'll be 14 in May, went off in the middle of the night. It had been at least six or seven years since I'd been, since it had been used and took us forever to find it. It had been set to 10 minutes and was powered by a single AAA battery. It's not a scary thing. It's actually kind of comforting. It's just the way things are befitting of dad so much. My sister and mom always say, if anybody could have figured out a way to hang around and make sure I act right, it's dad. Brings me some kind of solace in the fact that Maybe he can see that I've gotten my shit together a little bit, and this is his way of acknowledging it. There have been many other instances in the past few months, and researching I read that when a lot of emotion in a room where somebody passes, it can cause a spirit to linger. When my dad passed, there were probably 40 family members all gathered when he took his last breath. Anyway, just found this sub and wanted to share. I had a cool poltergeist experience in a Florida resort condo. I was in freshman year of high school when one of my friends asked if I wanted to go to Florida with him and his family. Well, we went, and the first half of the day was fine at the resort, until me and my friend went back to the condo. So quick view of the condo. The front door was at the front left corner of the condo, and to the condo from the inside of the condo, and to the right of the door was the kitchen and mine and my friend's room. In front of the kitchen and the door was the living room, on the same side my room is on the condo, but the other end is my friend's mom's and little brother's room. Now into the paranormal stuff. I was sitting on my bed facing the door looking into the living room. I saw a male, a teen or early twenties in red swim trunks. I remember he was white and he had short blonde hair. He walked from the kitchen area to my mom's room. I was shocked but kind of felt fun seeing a ghost. Later that night before bed, me and my friend witnessed some stuff get dragged. A pair of earbuds that was on the center drawer by my bed and a pillow got pushed from the center of my friend's bed onto the floor. The next morning we woke up to every drawer in my room and the bathroom inside my room, forgot to mention that and in the kitchen being pulled open, including the bathroom door, the closet door and our room door, which was locked. And later that night, or the night after, my friend went to ask his mom a question in her room. 
and when we walked by, he saw a black human-shaped lump on the couch. Thought it was his brother, so he kept walking. When he went to his mom's room, he found out his brother was taking a shower in her bathroom. He was freaked out for 30 or so minutes and wouldn't tell me what he saw, but told after a while. I don't remember anything else really happening after that. It was a fun ride hanging out with that ghost. I have a bunch of other paranormal stories that are as wild as that one. An anecdote in my grandmother's old house. This happened when I was approximately nine years old. I was at my grandmother's house along with her and my cousin. Just the three of us, there was no one else. I was laying down in the same room as my cousin, but we slept in separate beds. My grandmother was sleeping in her own bedroom, and I was approximately up at midnight for some strange reason. I couldn't fall asleep, and my cousin was already asleep. In that, I hear the singing of a woman in the living room. She also appeared to be wearing a white dress. I didn't see her face, and I only saw her partially. After a few seconds, she disappeared in the bathroom light, which was next to our room, suddenly turned on and then turned off. My cousin woke up suddenly, and he told me that he listened to her too. We were in shock, until we decided to leave our room to see what was happening. I went to my grandmother's room, and she seemed to be completely asleep, in her pajamas. She didn't seem to have gotten up. My cousin went to check the bathroom and said that there was nothing. We also checked the living room and the kitchen, and there was nothing and no one. The strangest thing of all is that this woman had the same tone of voice as my grandmother. But as I mentioned earlier, my grandmother was sleeping in her room and didn't seem to have gotten up. She also has very heavy sleep, and it's extremely rare for her to get up after midnight. Also, as far as I remember, she didn't have any white dresses. For starters, she never even wears dresses. My cousin and I were very surprised by this. We decided to go to sleep, though. Next morning, we didn't say anything to my grandmother, mainly so we didn't scare her, since she lived alone back then. However, we seriously asked if she had gotten up at midnight. She said no, that she was deeply asleep, as she put it. With the passage of time, and until now, I'm currently 20 years old, I keep thinking about it. This is the only unusual experience that's happened to me, for now. Why do the lights turn themselves on and pictures fall off walls, dishes rattle in the drying rack every day at my house? I live with my parents and older brother. I get up for the day around 12 or 1 a.m. every day. No one else gets up until 7 at the earliest, usually later. Since no one else is up, I'm very careful about being quiet and turning lights off. To the point that I double and triple check that yes, I physically flipped the switch. The light went off, no more light. This occurs in almost every room, but mainly our small hallway bathroom. I go in, turn the light off, make damn sure it's off, no other lights on in the house either. And I'll walk back out and less than five minutes later the bathroom lights on. Every morning, usually multiple times. Same deal with pictures either swinging or falling off the wall. No one is ever even awake besides me, and nowhere near the pictures. Same with the dishes in our drying rack. My house is small, but I'll be standing in my living room roughly 12 feet away from the dish rack, and it just rattles super loud. Not a little bit, I'm talking a ton of noise and commotion and movement. Occasionally a spoon or fork will eventually fall out, from the force of the rattling, that is. These occurrences usually aren't connected to 3 a.m., the witching hour or the dead time or whatever. They happen then too, but it's not exclusive to 3 a.m. For a little background, the house was built in, I believe, 1984. I'm pretty sure nobody's died in it. We also have one room that freaks all of us out, just super unsettling to be in there, like you're being watched or something. And none of any animals that we've ever owned have ever gone in there. They refuse and freak out if you try to carry them in. We pretty much just don't go in there. It's my dad's office now. But until he recently had to work from home due to COVID, nobody ever really went in there. 
like we each have our own bedroom, the living room and kitchen are all connected, just a big open space. If anybody has any suggestions about what might be causing these occurrences, or has had similar experiences, please let me know. I've lived in this house 17 years, and this has always happened, but it's happening much more frequently and much more intensely lately. I'm wondering why that is. Chukshin, mythical Korean toilet ghost. Chukshin was believed to appear as a young virgin with 150 centimeter long hair. The goddess, infuriated at her exile to the outhouse by the supreme deity Xion Zhuang, and kitchen goddess Zhuang Xin, they were said to spend time by counting all her hair. The goddess was believed to appear in the three days containing the number six. Koreans avoided the outhouse in these three days in order to not accidentally provoke her rage. Thus, Koreans held jizas, or rituals, to her in the 6th, 16th, and 26th days in the lunar calendar, or when a shoe or a child fell into the pit toilet. Jizas were also done for her when a pig contracted disease or died, when a prophecy warned of the anger of the goddess, or when the outhouse was built. In the jizas dedicated to the chuk shin, Koreans put all ingredients possible inside the chok, which was called the chong chok, meaning dong rice cake. <laughs> the tong chok was then served to the goddess. Non-glutinous rice was also served. She was regarded to be the most dangerous of the Gashin. She was believed to despise children, possibly because of her downfall by the child Noctisaijin, see below, and toppled them into the pit toilet. When children fell in the pit, it was believed that they would die before reaching maturity, unless a jesa was done to appease the goddess. If anyone entered the outhouse without coughing three times, Chuk Shin would be believed to use her long hair to attack the intruder. When the hair of Chuk Shin touched the skin of the intruder, the intruder's skin grew sick and died, as long with the person apparently. Even a mudang or shaman could not appease the goddess if she attacked a person with her hair. She was believed to embody a strip of cloth or white paper on the outhouse ceiling. She was also believed to be the deity of illegal punishment following the orders of the house deity Xiong Jung Xin. No gut or shamanistic rituals were held to dedicate Xiuk Xin, unlike the many guts and Bon Pulis biographies of deities dedicated to other Gashin. This was because it was believed that Shuk Shin was an evil and malevolent deity, unlike the other Gashin. Because of the conflict of Joang Shin and Chuk Shin, see Mon Jion Bon Puli, in Korean it was taboo to bring anyone from the outhouse into the kitchen and vice versa. Bear with me, I am obviously not Korean. My great granda lets me know that she was leaving us. Let me start off by saying that this happened when I was 13 years old. I'm 30 now. My great granda was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's when she came to live with my grandma, her biological daughter, and her son-in-law, my grandpa. I'm very close with both my grandpa and my grandma and was very close with my great grandma. I remember being excited when I found that she was coming to live with my grandparents, but I didn't fully understand the reason why. I would see her most every day, and we would be talking and she would forget who I was or would forget to speak English and start speaking to me in Spanish, which I didn't understand. This is when I was told what was going on in truth. Fast forward a few months and we were at a diner table. Great-grandma was eating her food, as was everybody else, and out of nowhere, she says, 
I love you, baby, so much. I'm really going to miss you when I leave. Of course, we all told her not to say such things and that she was going to be all right. Not long after that, I stayed up the night at my grandparents' house. My cousin and myself slept in one room, my grandparents in another, and great-grandma in the room across from ours. That night, I had a dream or a vision, I don't know, but I know it was great-grandma letting me know that she was leaving us. I was looking through the eyes of my grandma, who was looking at me, leaning over the bed with my head on great-grandma's chest, to see if she was breathing. I saw myself lean over the bed while I was looking through my grandma's eyes, standing in the doorway. That's when I woke up to my grandma shaking me, frantically saying, I think grandmama's dead. I shot out of the bed and ran into the room to see her lifeless. And just like I saw in my dream and vision, I leaned over the bed, put my head on her chest to listen for any signs of breathing. When I looked over at the doorway, Grandma was standing in the exact location where I was looking through her eyes, looking at me. I don't know why or how I saw this. I feel as if maybe this may have happened because we all had this strong connection. My great-grandma, grandma, and myself. Or because she wanted to let me know that she was going. I'm not sure. Either way, it still kind of haunts me, and I miss her terribly. There's times when I'll randomly smell her perfume, which is comforting, and I feel like she's around me. I still don't know what it was. This experience happened about six years ago. I was dog-sitting for a family friend of my then-girlfriend's family for some extra money. I would go over to their house once in the morning and once in the evening to feed the dog and walk around the backyard on a leash to do its business. It was a smaller dog, one of those that seemed to overcompensate for its size by trying to be big, bad, and scary, barking at everything with no fear. I was doing this for a solid week. On the second to last night I was over there, I was walking the dog in the backyard as usual. It was fairly dark by that time. Not pitch black, but dark enough that you couldn't comfortably walk around without a light. The moon was out, so that helped a bit, but I also had my phone's flashlight on. The backyard wasn't fenced, hence the leash. It was probably a good 15 feet or so of flat ground before it became thick, tall, grassy, weed-type foliage. Behind that was just woods. The dog always took a long time sniffing around every goddamn weed, rock, what have you. Then it suddenly froze, as if too scared to move a muscle. At the same time, I heard a rustling maybe 20 feet ahead of me and to my right. I shined my phone's flashlight over in the direction, but it was absolutely just not helpful. The rustling grew louder, but it didn't sound like it was getting closer to me. Finally, I started seeing the tall grassy foliage start to move, and then I saw something emerge from it. Its size was similar to that of an adult black bear, but it was covered in skin that was whitish in color. It wasn't filled out or bulbous like a bear, but seemed rather lean instead. Imagine a large white gorilla but with no hair hunched down on its front arms and legs. It didn't make any grunting or growling noises. It didn't make any grunting or growling noises, and somehow it looked like it was moving in slow motion. The dog, which would normally bark at anything, started to whimper. At this point, my eyes had started adjusting to the dim light, and I saw the thing turn its head towards me. I don't believe it had a face. I ran back to the house with that dog so fast I would have beaten Usain Bolt. The next day I went out with an actual flashlight. But nothing out of the ordinary happened. Except for a flash thunderstorm and neighbor putting a hole in my wall. Just sleep paralysis or an evil spirit. 
First of all, let me start off by saying I usually don't believe in evil spirits or being haunted by one. However, I absolutely love the subreddit and I've had such creepy encounters in my sleep that I felt like this is the right place to share them. The past couple of years, one or two years, I haven't had that good of an experience with sleep. I visited a small town in Italy with two of my best friends, who happened to be a couple this past summer. Of course, they slept in a double bed, while I slept on a convertible sofa in another room. Our accommodation was, to our surprise, located on top of a mountain, far, far away from the town that we had initially wanted to stay in. I'd say about a 15-20 minute bus ride, and the bus only drove three times a day. That was a huge disappointment, but not really part of the story. Since we were located on top of this mountain, right along the main road, where vehicles passed very seldomly, I tended to feel uneasy during the nighttime, especially since I slept alone and we rented a holiday apartment, not a hotel with many other people or something of that sort. The first night only got a little bit of sleep, also poor quality, but that was only because the sofa was a bit uncomfortable. On the second night, however, I woke up once in the middle of the night only to see a tall and slim outline of a person standing right at the foot of my bed, staring at me. Since I was so flustered and still tired, I didn't really process what was happening. I pulled up my blanket over my head and continued sleeping. The next morning I realized what happened, and I was petrified. I told my two friends at the breakfast table, and of course they called bullshit. I insisted that I knew what I saw, and I persuaded them to let me sleep in their bed for the next night, which was no problem since their bed was huge. Next night rolls around, and my best friend's boyfriend falls asleep relatively quick. However, my bestie and I were still up for 10 to 20 minutes, talking and whispering, trying not to wake our boyfriend up. Then we hear what sounds like somebody putting keys in the front door and entering the hallway. We both were convinced that there was a person in our apartment, walking around the kitchen and living room, where my sofa was located. We both froze and literally thought we were going to die that night. Since I've always had sketchy vibes ever since we first arrived, we woke up to the third party only for him to tell us to go back to sleep, which he did. Next morning, it turns out that there's another family staying in the apartment right beneath us, and a possible explanation would be that they entered their apartment yesterday night, but the both of us genuinely believed that there was somebody in our apartment casually walking around. On another not-so-pleasant occasion, I went to sleep normally in my bed a few months ago. I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night, only to find that I couldn't move my body. My limbs were numb, I couldn't turn my head, I couldn't speak. I felt completely paralyzed. I've had sleep paralysis before, so I know that this was just another night of bad sleep. However, this time was different. I saw my dad turning the light and walking around the hallways, passing my room, which isn't unusual, probably to get a glass of water or go to the toilet. I desperately and unsuccessfully tried calling out for him, but of course nothing but a whisper came out of his mouth. In that moment I felt so helpless. My dad got what he needed, turned off the light and went back to bed. And in the moment he switched off the light I saw a dark and tiny creature and blob of shadow sitting on my desktop chair and staring at me. I didn't know what it was, I didn't know what it wanted from me. All of a sudden, this shadow jumps up, runs right up to me on the side of my bed, then jumps onto my bed, only to repeatedly hop from one side of my pillow to the other. I felt so scared and terrorized in that moment, but I guess that terror finally woke me up and I could move again. The shadow was gone. I turned on the light and had to walk around my room for a few minutes just to return to reality and collect myself. I've had many similar events to this one but none were as horrible. After that night, I was afraid to go to bed for a couple of weeks. My dying mom makes a call to my brother. On December 25th, 2021, 
my mom entered the stage of life called active dying. Her skin was cold, her breathing labored. It reminded me of a fish out of water, and she was completely unresponsive. My family and I spent our last hours with her alive. My father called hospice to bring in an oxygen machine. We went to bed around 1 a.m. During that time, we spent in the living room. These walkie-talkies that we have started going off as if somebody pressed buttons on the other line. No speaking, just the static sound. My dad brought out these weeks prior so my mom could use them if she needed them at night since she slept in the living room and my dad was sleeping in their bedroom. Anyways, the walkie-talkies were making these noises randomly in the middle of the night. But I won't chalk it up to being paranormal even if it didn't make any sense that they would go off at that time. The creepy thing happens a few days later. My dad's going through my mom's phone to tell people who were texting her what had happened. Stuff like that. He comes across a call to my brother made at 1.25am on the 26th, right after we'd gone to sleep. She was in an unresponsive state. She could not have called anyone. We don't think she even had her phone near her while she was dying. It was probably in her purse since she had just driven home from a trip. To do that, she'd have to get up to find her phone when she could hardly breathe, let alone walk. And do it quiet enough to not wake up my dad who was sleeping on the couch. I doubt that my dad could have slept through her doing that since he would have just have gone to sleep. He hadn't been sleeping well for that week because any noise she would make he would get up to make sure she was okay. I doubt that night it would have been any different. Also, it would make sense that if she were to call anyone, he would maybe be my brother since my phone's broken and my sister doesn't use hers. So either she got up while she was dying, made a phone call to my brother, or she was already dead when she made it. Either situation freaks me out when I think about it. Aside from wondering how this happened, I also wonder what would happen if my brother had answered the call. One of my two ghost experiences. So as a kid, and just generally growing up in that house until moving away when I was in middle school, I did occasionally from time to time hear voices, where I'd hear the voices varied from the house itself to the garage that was next to the house. I didn't really think much of it until I brought this up to my sister. She told me that she once saw a spirit in the house. She remembers once seeing a reflection of someone in my older brother's bedroom window. This window was on the second floor, so we know for sure that it wasn't just some guy in the distance. She described this reflection as a bearded man in his mid-thirties. He had a little bit of a gut, but wasn't like he was obese. He just seemed a little fat, and his outfit seemed fairly normal. She told me he wore a flannel shirt with jeans so the spirit just looked like a lumberjack. So after swapping these stories, we decided to go to our parents about this, and let's just say they had something to say about it. So when my parents bought that house, it really needed to be worked on and repaired because the people that used to own it haven't actually lived or just looked after it in a very long time. So they actually worked on repairing and just repairing the house for the first year that they got it. My parents weren't all on their own when they were working on the house. They had a friend that was the exact physical description. And when we asked what happened to this guy, my parents told both of us that he actually hung himself in the garage when they were close to being finished with fixing the house. my other ghost story that I actually experienced. So our story starts in Maine, in a neighborhood reasonably close to Portland. I was up there to visit family pretty much, and the house in question belonged to one of my aunts, and I was with my aunt from Boston that wanted to drive up to visit them too. We showed up at the house, and I was just told that the house was already pretty old when my other aunt's family moved in. And that's the most I know about the history of the house. I might ask later because it sounds interesting. 
So we come in, settle down in the guest rooms, and we all start talking about the trip so far. And I make a joke about my outfit saying, oh yeah, I look like a Salem lesbian. We all have a laugh, and I soon forget about the comment. We jumped that night, and just occasionally throughout the night I hear scratching on the door. I wasn't that concerned yet, mainly because my aunt's family had a dog and a cat. But most of the time when I got up to let them in, the hallway was empty. Now at first, I wasn't worried. I was used to hearing scratches before the trip because I just have a generally needy cat. So to clear my mind before bed, I decided to take a shower. Though when I got out of the shower and I settled in, I heard my cousin walk to the bathroom and loudly say, Ah, damn, forgot to turn off the light. And from that moment, I knew something was up. Next night, pretty normal, though I did still keep hearing the scratching. So I decided to go down the stairs to grab a glass of water. But as soon as I was going to head back into the room, I heard a very clear yet feminine. You're not allowed to do that in my ear. And after a moment of confusion, I was kind of just happy I was leaving the next day. A strange story for my childhood. Me and my sister were in our room playing when my parents were in the TV room. Father was watching TV and mom was in the kitchen. It was fine when suddenly my sister saw a white translucent being with a beard and a grin on his face leaving our bathroom, which was inside our room, and moving to the TV lounge. My sister called me as I was facing backwards to the bathroom. I didn't clearly see the whole figure, just the white part of clothing at the brink of our door, so I didn't completely believe her. After five or ten minutes, my father started choking very badly and the creature returned to our room this time, and I'd left the room earlier, but my sister was there. The creature this time made a very evil, loud laughter that I heard and my sister then ran out of the room after hearing that. My father, after this laughter, after choking badly, fainted and mom was outside calling the ambulance on the phone. It's been years. Everything is fine now. My parents are still unaware of any creature or a sound. But if only it was me or my sister alone, I could call it as some imagination, but we both at a different place heard it and saw it, although I just saw a part of the creature's clothes. We changed our room after that and never used the bathroom. I did use it sometimes in daylight, but nothing happened. After we left home, the room and bathroom weren't in use, just during monthly cleaning. One day, my mother told us that while they opened the room, there were hundreds of lizards on the walls, so many that the wall was barely visible, and all in the blink of an AM, I rushed in a small hole outside like there was nothing before. I do not understand that last sentence. Moving on. Things I can't explain. While growing up, there were things that I'd seen that could be in a horror movie. In elementary school, my friends and myself saw a dead cat. It looked like a dog got a hold of it, so we buried it in the backyard. The next day, what did we see? Same cat in a ravaged looking state, walking by the gate and it stared menacingly before disappearing, never to be seen again could be a coincidence or a mistaken identity, so let me explain the other occurrences. There was a door in the dining room that always, just, and I repeat, always, was just closed properly, but it always opened by itself. You could slam the door, check the door, lock the door, but it was always open as if somebody slowly entered the room. In high school, I recalled using the desktop in the front room reading after I learned about Nostradamus. After doing so, I showed my older brother and cousin. My brother sat in front of the monitor while my cousin and I were on the side. And suddenly, as we reached the part where it said that his use of the occult led him to predicting his... 
soul would go to hell. Paraphrasing what I'm seeing here. There was a black disembodied arm that lay rest on the table. And in shock, my cousin and myself said, Did you see that? Then without initially, at the same time, we said the arm and decided to close the website. This is confusing. Now as we get deeper into things that happen, there was a friend of my brother who needed a place to stay, so she was invited in for a while. Ironically, the same things I just typed it, I said to her. She said that in school, on the island, they played a Ouija board and the participants saw a witch who was haunting them. Thought nothing of it and felt that she was just telling a tall tale, but strange things started happening. I can't say if it was the house I lived in or maybe something that was up with me, but when she came it was as if her energy I could feel. It started with me hearing voices similar to relatives who in fact was not there at 3am in the morning, to seeing more things like shadow figures and evil spirits. I often told people, if I see a spirit, it has a slight white while being translucent but I always saw a full figure with details. Then suddenly I'm being bothered by a presence when I'm by myself. It was like a deep growling, like some sort of beast in my ear, and I always have to break free and it leads to insomnia. My sister and myself even saw while my mother was in the kitchen cooking a large thing, and I'll do my best to describe it. You can describe it, but I don't know if I understand what you're saying was huge, at least six foot, walked on hooves, bulky wax looking skin and a face with hair that reminded me of the predator. Got really bad to the point where I had to get prayed over and anointed with oil. That night, after the prayers as I lay in bed, the thing came to bother me but it slammed up against a barrier that was solid white and I found peace, for a while that is. I apologize, no disrespect, it's just written very crazily. Faceless Man Nearly five years ago, when I was 16, my dad and I went on vacation around Christmas to Boulder, Colorado. We rented this little house pretty far out of town in the mountains was located in this sort of ravine or meadow in between two tall steep mountains and had a medium-sized stream running right in front of it. It seemed like a really neat house when we were just looking online at it because one side was completely made of grass and was isolated in the forest. Well the first night came and everything still seemed all right. I had brought my little dog along and of course he needed to pee in the middle of the night. I was kind of spooked at the idea of going outside at 1am, but more because I was afraid of bears or cougars or whatever. I tried to wake my dad up, but he had been taking some sleeping pill and literally refused to wake up. So I put on my coat and everything and went outside with my dog. I had a high powered flashlight and as I was walking out of the yard, I was sort of scanning the light along the edge of the valley. I saw something across the creek that I wasn't expecting. There was a man standing out there. I froze for a minute. Then, like a total idiot, I yelled, Who's there? I really just thought it may have been, I don't know, in the moment I thought it was like a night ice fisherman. I didn't get scared until he didn't answer. And by then, I started to notice some weird things about him was freezing like probably negative 10 Fahrenheit at least, but this man wasn't wearing a coat. It was like I couldn't see any details about him, almost like he was a solid shadow. Even though I was close enough and the light was bright enough to see the trees behind him in detail, I was shining this super bright light right into his face, but he wasn't recoiling whatsoever or putting his hands to cover his eyes or anything. Also, the longer I looked at him, the weirder he seemed. He didn't seem to be moving at all, like not even shifting his shoulders to breathe or anything. He looked to be average height and build, but the other weird thing, first I thought he was wearing a face mask, like the kind of people wear when they go skiing, 
but this mask covered his entire head, as if the entire face was one smooth black surface. He was certainly facing me, though. I was not looking at him from the back. The longer I stood there, the more scared I got until I sprinted back inside, yanking my little dog behind me. I could still clearly see him through the glass side of the house, and I was very alarmed to see that he had swiveled. He had sort of smoothly tracked my movement into the house, but it didn't seem like he had moved his feet or anything. I ran upstairs and tried again to wake up my dad. I told him that there was a man standing outside the house. He sort of shuffled over to the window, saw him, but said it was probably a druggie and went back to sleep. I probably should have called 911, but my dad didn't seem concerned. I thought he would get mad if I caused a stir about it, so I didn't do anything. I did watch the man, though, all night. The man stood in the exact same place for hours, never moving, not even seeming to breathe. He didn't seem phased whatsoever by the extreme temperature, he just seemed to stare right at me and I stared back. At one point I looked away, and when I came back to the window, I was shocked to see that he was gone. An odd movement grabbed my attention though. This is the bit that I find the hardest to describe or explain. He seemed to be glitching. He was behind a big tree, so I couldn't really make out a lot. But over and over, I kept seeing his arm and leg come out from behind the tree, then smoothly slide back to a normal standing position. It really looked like a video game character glitching, but in real life. At some point, I dozed off, and when the sun came up, he had disappeared. It was such a bizarre experience, I wasn't sure if it was real. It just didn't seem like the quintessential ghost or slender man or whatever so I don't know what to really make of it. My dad reconfirmed, though, the next day that he'd definitely seen the man, so at least wasn't hallucinating. I also walked across the bridge to where the man was standing, in the day, of course, and there were not any footprints or any other confirming evidence that the man was there at all. It continues to be one of the most significant paranormal experiences I've ever had. I did try to take photos during the event as well, I also photographed the entire property. When I got home, the SIM card was corrupted, quote unquote, and all the footage was lost. I don't know if that was just bad luck or part of the experience, but I'd never had a problem with my camera before and never had a single problem like that since. Additionally, the house that we rented has been taken down from every single house renting website, so I can't find any trace of it. Even when I reverse searched the single image of the house that I'd saved on my computer before the trip, Haunted Bathroom. I've lived in the same house since I was four, and I'm currently 20. The bathroom adjacent to my bedroom is the kids' bathroom and appears to have been since the house was built in the 1940s. It's also funny because when we moved in, we remodeled some parts of the house, including the bathroom. It's all white, with white tile and granite and bright lighting, which doesn't really seem to fit the fact that a ghost haunts it. The first time I ever experienced anything really scary in that bathroom was when I was around eight. I was taking a bath and I was alone. I was just chilling, reading a book or whatever, when I heard a girl's voice inside the bathtub. Like it sounded like it came from directly above me, as if the ghost was hovering a few inches above me in the bath. It said, hello, several times, and I was terrified. At first I was frozen, then I absolutely high-tailed it out of there. After that, I hated the bathroom near my room. I refused to even enter it for at least a month and had to go all the way downstairs to the bathroom and shower and brush my teeth in the kitchen sink. Well, nothing much ever really happened for many years after that. It wasn't until I was much older, probably 13 or so, that things started happening there again. The next run-in with this ghost was by far the worst. I was alone at night. My mom was out on a date wasn't a big deal and I was used to it, so I wasn't already scared or freaked out. 
I was hanging out in my room and I had my dog sitting next to me. The door to my room was open. I wasn't paying attention, listening to music and playing a game or something, when my dog jumped up and looked at the door. I followed his gaze and saw a dark figure at the door. It was child height and appeared to be a little girl. She had black hair that was dripping wet and the rest of her face looked to be dark gray. She was peering around the corner of the door so that I could only see her head. As soon as I saw her, she ran down the hallway and stairs. I could hear her running. It didn't occur to me whatsoever that it was a ghost at the time. The fact that both the dog and I could see her, then I could hear her running down the hallway made me think it was an intruder. I was so scared that it also didn't register that the intruder was a small girl. It just... I just thought that there was somebody else in the house. It felt like lightning was coursing through my body. I ran into the bathroom and hid myself in a cabinet, then called the police. The police came and searched the entire house and had to come pull me out of the cabinet. But they said that they didn't find anything, and in fact, the house alarm was still on when they arrived, which meant that none of the doors or windows had been opened since my mom left. Not a week after this incident, another thing happened. I was standing in the bathroom watching my face. I got a strong feeling something was behind me, but I ignored it, thinking it was just because my eyes were closed. But out of nowhere, I was, well, almost, like, possessed. I lost consciousness for a moment. It was as if I were taken to a different place. It was like an empty black space with nothing anywhere. The floor was made of water and I was soaking wet. In the distance, there were these glowing purple lights. Then I heard a voice. It was the same voice that I heard in the bathtub years ago. But this time it was in my head, not out loud. It said my name, Lucy, over and over. Then I woke up. I was on the floor of the bathroom. It was so strange, it was like I had been in some spiritual journey or something. I suddenly knew things about this ghost. I knew it was a child. I knew her name, like I knew instinctively that Lucy was her name. I knew that she died in that bathroom. And I knew that she was friendly but lonely, that she wanted me to know about her death, but didn't actually mean to scare me. I wasn't freaked out, really. It was more relieving to find out what all these events were, or that she wasn't an evil spirit or anything. I tried to run and tell my mom what had just happened, who, by the way, thought I was being crazy about the whole thing and was still angry that I messed up her date a week earlier by calling the police when nobody was actually in the house. But she definitely thought I was just acting like a loon. And I mean, who wouldn't think that? Since then, the bathroom is still 100% haunted.